Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We are here to uh, we are here today to discuss denuclearization in Northeast Asia. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Akari Endo from Japan, a member uh, a member of the Secretariat for the Japan NGO Network for Nuclear Weapons Abolition. I am today's facilitator, and uh, she is also facilitator. So please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you here today. Thanks for coming to this session. My name is Annalise Geisbert. Um, I'm also part of the civil society delegation from Japan. I'm specifically representing Ant Hiroshima, which is an NGO based in Hiroshima. And I'll be doing, um, I guess, facilitation support, specifically checking your questions in the chat. So for those of you online, please feel free to send any questions you may have for our speakers throughout the session, and we'll try to get to them during the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Annalise. And uh, this special session to discuss nuclear issues in Northeast Asia, uh, including the meaning of the TPNW for the region and how uh, Northeast Asia denuclearization de will contribute to global efforts for nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear abolition. This is a chance to uh, hear from speakers, both in Vienna and online. We have three speakers today. After the presentations, we will take some questions, as uh, analysts mentioned. Uh, even, this event is uh, coordinated by Peace Board and the, the Global, P Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. We call the GPAC, a global network of uh, peace building organizations. Peace Board coordinate, uh, coordinated GPAC in Northeast Asia. Northeast Asia Northeast Asia is a region which has experienced the uh, horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And today, face a very real nuclear threat with two nuclear weapons states. We will hear from uh, former mayor of Hiroshima, Akiba Shinori, and now advisor of Japan Congress against the A and H bombs about the situation boards overall and in Japan. We will then hear from uh, Fuan Su Yong of ICANN Partner Organizations, People's Solidarity for Partner, uh, part, Participatory uh, Democracy, PSPD, based in Seoul, about the efforts now for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula which has been in a state of uh, armistice, uh, armistice for more than 70 years, with still no official end to the Korean War. And we will hear from Ambassador and Han. Uh, sorry, my mistake, and Han of the Mongolian NGO Blue Banner. He played a great role in Mongolia becoming a single state nuclear weapons free zone. And they will share about their experiences, including as the first uh, Northeast Asia country to re, uh, ratify the TPNW. A chance to consider uh, regional challenges and the efforts for nuclear disarmament, including which though not able to be in Vienna in person. Hope for this uh, to be a way to develop more uh, cooperation between civil society in Northeast Asia and beyond. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all and hope you enjoy this special occasion. Thank you. And now, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Akiba, uh, Akiba-san, please. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Well, good, mo good morning in Vienna. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you are here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ICANN and other organizers of this very important civil uh, event in Vienna prior to the first meeting of state parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW. 
And I'm delighted to share uh, this place with my uh, fellow peace worker, uh, Su Yong Fang from Korea, and also my, um, well, somebody I highly respect, Ambassador Eng Sai Hang, Yergul Sai Hang uh, from Mongolia. Um, I hope that uh, we'll be able to engage in some conversation at a at late, later point. The first point I must uh, start, uh, my brief comment is to point out that uh, Prime Minister Kishida and his cabinet will not be present at the State Party's meeting in Vienna. However, I'd like to also emphasize that the Japanese people, not the government, are well represented um, in this uh, event uh, halls and also in connection with various activities supporting uh, the ratification of TPNW by Japan, not only by Japan, but all the nuclear weapon states. And, and it is precisely what the meaning of this participation by the people of Japan here that I'd like to talk about and uh, how we can utilize that enthusiasm, um, that commitment to change the Japanese government's uh, policies and um, those of nuclear weapon states. And basically what I'm going to say has been concisely um, put together by my friend and the leader of our de delegation, Mr. Yasunari Fujimoto, in his working paper. But I'd like to add a few uh, points of my own, and also I'd like to be more blunt in stating some of the points, which uh, Mr. Fujimoto managed not to do because he's a gentleman. And uh, so let me start with uh, February 24th. When the Russian invasion started, uh, of Ukraine, of course. Two additional, invasion itself was quite shocking, as you all experienced, but two additional shocking uh, sets of statesmen came out. One was, of course, President Putin's threat of use of nuclear weapons. That was devastating to the Hibakusha and to many of us in Japan who know uh, the living hill right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we had to do something about it. So immediately, Hibakusha and I started a, a signature collection campaign via a site, internet site, called change.org. And within a week, we got 50,000 signatures supporting the cause that we should not let Mr. Putin use nuclear weapons. And within a month, the number increased to 100,000. We reached out to Mr. Putin, Mr. Kishida, and also the leaders of nuclear weapon states, urging them to take action so that no nuclear weapons would be used in Ukraine. But uh, responses were somewhat, somewhat unsatisfactory. Another shocking fact was that many right-wing Japanese politicians started, uh, really started shouting, started coming out of their closets and say, hey, this is the time Japan should possess nuclear weapons. That is the only way Japan could protect itself. Look at Ukraine. Ukraine was attacked because it did not have nuclear weapons, as if the panacea to all the world problems was the position of nuclear weapons. Well, that uh, really did not stand uh, very well among many more rational and peace-loving sectors of the Japanese population. Now, instead, what we have been trying to accomplish in that region was so-called the Northeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Treaty involving Japan Republic of Korea and DPLK, uh, People's uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea for short, um, 
who will declare non-possession of uh, nuclear weapons, and the surrounding country, China, Russia, and the United States, will guarantee that they will not attack those three core countries with nuclear we weapons. That's the substance of the Northeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty. That's an ideal a direction that many of us you know, have actually pursued. But it did not come to a concrete step you know, toward formalizing this or negotiations toward that really have not started. Now, when you look at some of these facts I mentioned, President Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, Japanese right-wingers, you know, just the adamant expression to possess nuclear weapons, and also in general, lack of interest, especially in the Japanese government, in pursuing the North nu uh, Northeast Asia nuclear weapon-free zone. Behind all of this is clearly a cause, and that cause is that the devastation, the the living hell, the tragedy, you know, human sufferings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have not been understood by these people. And I include Mr. Kishida. Well, I have some questions, but you know, he is the only elected government official from the district where the A-bomb dome is located and where the hypocenter of the 1945 atomic bombing is located. Since he is the only elected official representing that district, that means that he has the responsibility to represent the voices of Hibakusha, not only to the Japanese diet, but also to the entire world, showing what these Hibakusha who suffered there 77 years ago wish the world to do. Their wish is not selfish. Their wish is to make sure that no one else in the world will suffer as they did, which would only guarantee the future survival of the human race. So that is the context in which we all have to talk about uh, what's going on, especially President Putin's uh, irresponsible and callous statement, uh, Japanese right-wingers, childish statements that uh, if they possess nuclear weapons, everything will be all right. So, in order to advance this line of thinking, I would like to make a few suggestions. Now, first of all, Japanese government should do more. Now, rather than complaining about that uh, they haven't done much, uh, isn't going to produce much. But I would like to um, point out a few things. In the 1990s, the foreign ministry, together with the Japanese government, um, instituted a program of sending young foreign ministry officials to Hiroshima to talk with the Hibakusha to learn about the realities of Hibakusha by, go, by going to the museum and by going to, to talk with the experts in the area. And that included the top-ranking official from the foreign ministry and the secretary, secretary of the ministry. But for some strange reason, as soon as tw the 21st century came, they abandoned the program. I propose that they reinstitute this learning process, unless the Japanese ministry learns the truth about nuclear weapons, about the atomic bombing, the world certainly will be less prepared to face that fact. One more thing, since I mentioned Mr. Kishida being the representative of the atomic bomb district, I suggest that he and his cabinet well, that's less than 20, should visit Hiroshima and talk to the Hibakusha, saw the museum, and talk with students, young people, about death and life and the future of humanity. That's, well, in a sense, nothing. 
all you need is just one day for 15 or 20 people to visit Hiroshima, and symbolically that will send a clear message that Japan is finally ready to listen to the Hibakusha and send that voice to the rest of the world so that everybody who is opposed to the T TPNW would start seeing why it is necessary that such a legal uh, framework must be established at this point. It is not too late. In Ukraine, you see war in real time. In no 1945, you did not see the atomic bombings in real time. But it's not late. We, can, we have many ways of compensating for that gap in real time in present te day technology. And I'm sure the other two participants will add a lot more and different uh, dimensions. And I'm quite happy to return to make uh, some engaging conversations if that becomes possible. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Taki. I, I learned a lot from your voices. Thank you so much. And next speaker is uh, Huan Seung from Korea. We will then hear from her. It is OK? Do you hear me? Thank you. Yeah. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello from Seoul. I'm Seung Hwang from Center for Peace and Disarmament of PSPD, South Korean NGO. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry that I can't not be here with you in Vienna, where the historic DPNW first meeting will be held. But I'm happy to talk about the situation in Northeast Asia like this. Uh, first of all, the Korean Peninsula is now one of the regions where the threat of nu nuclear war is increasing. As you all know, the military tension surrounding the Korean Peninsula has increased recently. Two Koreas and the U.S. have not given up their military reliance on nuclear weapons and have recently strengthened and shown up. North Korea conducted a test firing of an ICBM in March. The ROK US conducted a joint military exercise with a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. Every day there is new there are news about missile tests and military exercises conducted by North Korea and South Korea and, and the US. The result of the recent ROK US summit have made us even more concerned. This is because there are many agreements that will increase the risk of military tension and nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula. The US and South Korea agrees to discuss the resumption of a high-level consultative group uh, about extended deterrence strategies the expansion of joint military exercises and the develop, deployment of U.S. strategic assets. And the U.S. said it would use all available defense capabilities, including nuclear capabilities. There are many reports predicting North Korea's nuclear test. I don't think there's much need for North Korea to conduct a seventh nuclear test technically. Rather, it seems more necessary for North Korea to develop its delivery capabilities such as missiles. But, but Pyongyang declared its commitment to continued reinforce of its defense in 2021. Pyongyang's plan include advancing its nuclear technology as well as developing a wide range of new weapons, uh, including tactical nuclear weapons, uh, super Raji nuclear warhead, underwater launch nuclear strategic weapons, and so on. Therefore, North Korea's nuclear test could happen again at any time, we think. In fact, it seems that North Korea has long abandoned the idea of resolving it through dialogue with South Korea and the US. 
The U.S. talks about the unconditional unconditional dialogue, but I think it's time for a dialogue with conditions. We have to create conditions for conversation again, uh, cross-border communication lines between two Koreas which were restored last year, have not yet been cut off. Uh, if South Korea and the U.S. take appropriate steps to reduce the military threat against North Korea, including the suspension of joint, joint military exercises, it could change the atmosphere. The international community's policy of making North Korea give up its nuclear weapons through sanctions and pressure has failed for the past 20 years. While North Korea has maintained its nuclear test and ICBM test moratorium, South Korea and the U.S. have not taken proper steps to reduce military threat to North Korea, feels and build trust. It is one of the reasons why North Korea has decided to run an ICBM test again. I think the way to resolve the nuclear conflict on Korean Peninsula is to improve relations. Next year, it will be 70 years since the Korean War Armistice Agreement was signed. Denuclearization is impossible unless we end on unstable ceasefire system and end the long-lasting hostile relations among the countries involved in Korean War and shift to a normal diplomatic relationship and create a situation where we no longer have to prepare for war against each other. Civil society in South Korea focuses on this part. Uh, seven major religions and numerous civil society organizations have been conducting uh, the Korea Peace Appeal, peace campaign to end the Korean War since 2020. A signature movement calling for an end to the Korean War, a peace treaty, and a nuclear free Korean Peninsula are our important activities. I think we can promote the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula by improving relations and building trust. No problem can be solved by the demonizing and pressing North Korea. Also, I think that denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula cannot be achieved only by eliminating North Korea's nuclear weapons. It is only possible if the U.S. nuclear umbrella, which South Korea and Japan depend on, is also eliminated. The military policy of relying on nuclear weapons in and around the Korean Peninsula should be eliminated altogether. This is the way for a nuclear weapon-free Korean Peninsula can also serve as a stepping stone toward the creation of the North East Asia nuclear weapon-free zone. The Korean Peninsula is a region where the threat of nuclear war persisted. And South Korea has the second largest number of atomic bomb victims in the world after Japan. So there is no reason not to join the TPNW. However, when we asked about joining the DPNW, South Korean government officials said, of course, I agree with the vision of the nuclear free world. However, in reality, it is difficult to join the treaty now. I expect that it will be difficult for the South Korean government to join the treaty or do anything in support of the treaty before on and the end of the Korea War, Korean War Armistice. The same is true of Ottawa Treaty or the Convention on Cluster Munition too. There are so many steps South Korea has to go through to join the TPNW, but it is clear that the vision of another world that we want is the, a way for all nations to join the treaty and eliminate all nuclear weapons on Earth. Therefore, I think next week's first meeting of the TPNW parties will have great implication for the world. It will serve as an opportunity to further consolidate the taboo against nuclear weapons. 
I think the South Korean government will feel a lot as it watches the prepared countries take a step forward a uh, new world. It will also have great implications for many South Koreans who think that North Korea's nuclear weapons are a bad thing and that but the new U.S. nuclear weapons are a good thing. So the global standard is moving in a direction that nuclear weapons are unacceptable in any case. Uh, we will continue to play a role in promoting the progress of the TPNW to South Korean people and promoting the reasons why the South Korean government should join the treaty. I look forward to the day when two Koreas join the TPNW together after an end of the Korean War. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sion. Uh, really glad to hear you, your uh, opinions. And now, uh, during the uh, MS, well, first MSP, it's easy to focus on uh, countries that already ratified TPNW, but we must not forget the global victims by nuclear weapons and the nuclear testing. It means no country is left behind. So thank you very much. And now we, uh, uh, I would like to announce one thing. Uh, um, so the um, end the nuclear war campaign. Um, we also have some posters here in the back, which you could take pictures with um, to show your support for this campaign to say end the Korean War. And so they're in the back of the room. So if you're interested um, on your way out or as the session winds down, please um, go ahead and take a photo there. And there are also forms. You can see them in the back now being held up. Yeah. So feel free to take a photo with them. And then they also have some uh, forms where you can join the signature ca campaign to promote the end of the Korean War. So um, if you have a moment, I recommend you uh, participate. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, you also have the papers to sign. So please, uh, if you have any interest and uh, uh, the motivation to aid, please sign for this paper. Thank you. So next speaker is uh, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Ensign Han, Han. Do you hear me? Yes, I do hear you. Thank you. Well. Thank you. So floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say that I'm happy and even honored to participate in this event to talk about denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in, or in the Northeast Asia. As it was pointed out by one of you, Mongolia is honored to be a state party to the uh, TPNW, and we look forward for, uh, for other Northeast Asian countries to join us very soon. It's not going to be easy, but nevertheless, we should work for that. I think international and national civil society organizations have played an important role, and we should un underline that, in having the TPNW discussed, approved, signed, and now it's, it's already uh, entered in, into force. Today, the non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon zones are even more important now. Their role is more important to promote broader participation in increasing the number of states, parties to the DPNW, and to work also with other non-nuclear weapon states, as well as with umbrella states, and through them to try to reason with the nuclear weapon states. It's a tall order, but nevertheless, I think this is the way I think we should work. It is also, I think, important for uh, NGOs to work not only with their own government, but also with broader public, with NGOs and other international uh, NGOs as well. Very important. Now I would like to say a few words about briefly about Mongolia. Why Mongolia is being interested? Why Mongolia is be, is trying to be as active as possible. Though our two neighbors, we have two neighbors, Russia and China, they still see Mongolia as a buffer 
what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is try to play a bridge building role, not only between the two big uh, powers, nuclear powers, but in the region based on its comparative advantage. I believe that every country should know their own comparative advantages and based on that to promote their issues, the common issues or their own issues. What is Mongolia's comparative advantage? First, unlike uh, countries in, in Northeast Asia, we have no territorial or border problems. In fact, in fact, I participated in border, border demarcation between Mongolia and the Soviet Union. Our approach to the regional issue can be said as uh, a duck is calm when the lake is calm. Duck, you know, it's a small country. Hence, we try to promote an active foreign policy, be not only consumer of uh, regional security and stability, but try to contribute to it as well. Thus, for example, in the nuclear area, uh, we host four fully uh, certified CTBTO stations on our own territory. Primary seismic, infrasound, radionuclide, and nuclear and noble gas stations. This is our contribution to the overall uh, goal. We try to uh, promote good relations with all the countries, and everybody knows that we do not have any hidden agenda regarding North Korean, uh, North Korean issue or South Korean issue or regarding the Korean Peninsula in general. We want them to be to work together and try in the near in the some future to become a united uh, nation. Uh, in that sense, Mongolia maintains good relations with two uh, Koreas at the same time. It has traditional relations with North Korea and uh, strategic partnership relations with South Korea. And based on our good relations, what we're trying to do is to promote 1.5 track inclusive process. I would like to underline inclusive, not uh, exclusive, which is very, very important in this uh, day and age. So we're, we're promoting the Ulaanbaatar uh, dialogue. It is an inclusive process, but it focuses not on the hard security issues, which is the, the great powers, you know, have more uh, reason and more voice there. But what we're trying to do is to focus on soft security issues, meaning infrastructure development, economic and environmental cooperation, and very important confidence building and promotion of cooperation. Blue Banner, our, my organization, together with GPAC Northeast Asian Network, is also promoting a constructive track to inclusive uh, dialogue, known as Ulaanbaatar process, among Northeast Asian civil society organizations to promote and strengthen regional CSO in building regional peace and stability by creating in Mongolia a political space where they can come and talk and discuss the issues and venue where, where they can. Briefly about the, uh, what's happening uh, in the world because we cannot ignore that. The war in Ukraine vividly demonstrates that much needs to be done to strengthen peace and security throughout the world. The second Cold War is knocking on the door if it is not already opening the door. There is mutual suspicion as well as nuclear threat is on the rise. There is also a hidden threat of the use of the so-called low yield or tactical nuclear weapons. Even the thought of this should not be allowed to happen. Such talks would only serve to legitimize nuclear weapons, including in Northeast Asia, in our region. Testing of low yield or tactical nuclear weapons missiles are being undertaken already in our region. This could have a dominant effect on the states of the region 
all of them except Mongolia are nuclear capable uh, uh, with respect to the level of development of nuclear uh, industry. Mongolia's experience. As a result of more than 80 meetings and talks with the nuclear weapon states, Mongolia was able to acquire, it took us about, I think about 20 years to acquire their recognition of Mongolia's nuclear weapon free status and promise and pledge not to contribute to any act that would violate it. That, that uh, joint declaration they have made not only to Mongolia and to the world, but also to each other. That is why I think it's very important. This uh, result shows that big and small states can agree on issues affecting their interests. It, it, would, it is not easy, but nevertheless, there is a possibility. Mongolia now is prepared to work actively with other states of this region to work actively to establish a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone, which is very important. But an important part of that is, of course, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. A number of regional uh, meetings of NGOs and think tanks of this region have been held, including in Mongolia. Thus, last week, Blue Banner, this organization, hosted a hybrid conference on the possible role of nuclear weapon-free zones and nuclear weapon-free uh, state in promoting the goals of TPNW and NPT. We have uh, adopted a joint statement which stated, which called, which called for further strengthening of the TPNW through, through its broader signing and ratifying, as well as for uh, concrete results for arms control and nuclear disarmament at the forthcoming 10th NPT uh, review conference. Another uh, point that uh, uh, the statement made was that the very concept of nuclear weapons results needs to be made inclusive. This is very important because we all know that a nuclear weapon-free world will be as strong as its weakest link. And weakest links are single state uh, zones, which are, so far have not been recognized by international law as lawful nuclear weapon-free zones. So in that uh, connection, we have uh, called for the second comprehensive study of nuclear weapon-free zones. The first one was uh, undertaken 47 years ago. After that, five nuclear weapon zones have been established, three are uh, under consideration. Therefore, a second uh, comprehensive study of nuclear weapon -free zones, I think is very important. That should include the issue of a single state nuclear weapon -free zones as well. And that also should make attention on Northeast Asian nuclear weapon -free zones, which is very, very impor important. Other, uh, briefly about other lessons learned. Uh, uh, during our negotiations with the P5, we understood that we should never under, uh, underestimate ourselves, our country, and we should try to uh, work on the basis of comparative advantage, which any country uh, uh, based anywhere in the world can have and provide to the nuclear weapon uh, free. Uh, it is important also to clearly articulate your interest and how that affects others. Because countries will think, what is in it for me? How is it affecting uh, uh, me and my country and so on? When discussing issues, I think you should also approach, look at the larger picture. Just sub-regional or regional issues sometimes is not enough. You have to show a larger picture, especially to nuclear weapon states, so that they will know what, what's in there. Perseverance and persistence is very important. That's why, as, as I said, we had more than 80 meetings with the nuclear weapon states. And the last but not least, a very optimistic approach 
is important since the power of positive thinking provides energy and search for positive solutions. In closing, I would like to say that I talked about Mongolia to make one point, that even small states can contribute to common cause. And that if small states can do, the middle-sized states and umbrella states can also do even more. And all this, of course, the role of NGOs is as important as ever before. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and Sai Han. I, uh, uh, from your uh, presentation, I learned uh, both government and the NGOs' action are very important, and uh, also uh, I thought maybe Mongolian F, uh, efforts is a little bit difficult to create the free zone for, for one state can do to create the free zone uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, we can learn a lot from your experiences. Thank you very much. And now we move on to Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let us know on chat. Or do you have any questions for three speakers? OK, so go ahead and stand up and say your question. And then once you're done, I'll repeat it very quickly so that everyone online can hear as well. Thank you. Um, do I need to introduce myself again? Yeah. Um, my name's John Cairns. I'm from the Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. I am new to this sector. I am Scottish, and like most English-speaking people, I am linguistically challenged, so I apologise if this is a daft question. Would you say the Japanese government are portraying the political reasons for having nuclear weapons and the physical impact that these weapons have on human beings as two different issues that are not related, or are they just completely ignoring the effect physically on a human being? Yes, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, there was the uh, repercussion. I couldn't hear the question very well. So I believe, I think the question was how um, is it possible that, how can the Japanese government reconcile its position on nuclear weapons with the actual impacts that have happened to Japanese people from nuclear weapons? The, um, actually, I have been thinking about the Scottish uh, efforts to be exemplary in terms of a region, uh, geographically Scottish region, Know, have done so well even to uh, call for a referendum to gain independence. And the Japanese situation is similar in that most of the regions in Japan declare themselves nuclear weapon free. Now, however, the, well, perhaps the, the biggest um, difference, well, it might not be the difference that the most countries will actually take a similar position to the Japanese government. But the uh, Japanese government's um, stance on war and uh, the sufferings that war caused to the Japanese people, that has been uh, prob problematic to say the least. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples. You know that the Hibakusha, Hibakusha from 1945, and they suffered medically, and you know they quite often had uh, the living difficulties, and also uh, they also had the, the fear of hereditary uh, effects and uh, many others, uh, discrimination existed and so forth. So obviously they needed uh, 
help from the Japanese government. Well, you know, perhaps uh, the American government should have come in, but because of the, the legal complexity, the Japanese government was to take care of the Japanese hibakusha in many, many ways. But in 1980, the government asked a body of scholars, including the past presidents of uh, University of Tokyo, that's the top university in Japan, uh, two ex-presidents uh, are included in the seven-person panel to answer the question about how to deal with the, the Hibakusha's difficulty. The conclusion was, to, to put it simply, the country starts the war. And, and because it's a war, the entire nation is involved. And of course, there will be victims. However, it is a national war all the Japanese people will have to bear the consequences. All the sacrifices will have to be borne by the people. Okay, so the, worst, the country starts the war, you know, however, it's the, the people you know, that suffer and that really have to accept the, all the ills of war. Okay, that's one. Okay, one, one more. In connection with the, the war in Ukraine, that uh, the Russian ambassador in Japan stated on, on TV program that, you know, just when I asked about uh, the Russian tanks and other uh, airplanes and, and so forth, attacking hospitals, schools, and uh, civil homes and citizens. And uh, Russian ambassador Galujin said that no, 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 no that uh, Ukraine turned all hospitals, schools, and ordinary houses into factories. So we are not attacking civil buildings. We are attacking ammunition buildings, factories, military facilities, and try to get away with it. Well, then many Japanese thought about what happened on March 10th, 1945, when 100,000 people were killed by the fire raid, um, which was commandeered by Curtis Lumet. And uh, he was later awarded the highest uh, deco decoration from the Japanese government in 1964. But in his memoir, he stated that what they killed, 100,000 people in Japan, were not civilians. In Japanese houses, small houses had one house ha was building balls, the other one was creating screws, another one was creating hammers. So all these houses in Tokyo, in total 100,000 people, were war factories, and we did not kill civilians. Okay, so that's basically the Japanese government's attitude toward war and the sacrifices that people will have to, well, I don't know the, the word to properly describe it, but anyway, endure the sufferings that the government really has no business in taking care of. So that's the Japanese government policy. That applies to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all other atrocities caused by war. And the unfortunate thing is the people who remember such things and remember the irresponsibility of the national government um, is decreasing. And so at the current moment, many younger generations think it's a good idea for the Japanese government to possess nuclear weapons because that would protect uh, Japan from being nuclear attacked from neighboring countries. So that's, if that, that sort of gives you some hint of... Um, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Akiba. And, uh, uh, this time is over, so we just uh, uh, closing remarks. Uh, sorry for the, uh, we could have one question, so we we can have discussion after this session. So uh, uh, talk freely uh, as 
us and uh, also Mr. Akiba. And briefly, uh, this closing remarks, uh, TPNW has had the efforts uh, over Hiroshima people, uh, Hibakusha people, sorry. There are also efforts by countries that do not have nuclear weapons. It is important for NGOs and the, each and the, every country to take the initiative to abolish nuclear weapons. There are nuclear weapons free zones all over the world. The Mongolian experiences has, uh, uh, has, tol has told us that mm, uh, their theory and uh, the efforts of both government and the citizens in order to make uh, Northeast Asia a nuclear weapons free zones. Uh, it is necessary for each country to work trust between uh, trust the uh, excuse me, Northeast Asia nuclear weapons. It is necessary for each country to work together in solidarity. However, in order this to do so, there must be a relationship of trust between countries. To take the example of Japan, Japan must consider and reflect on the World War II and show a willingness to cooperate with the countries of Northeast Asia. In the global balances of power, the sale of nuclear, weapons, uh, nuclear deterrence has been uh, maintained until now. But we are witnessed is the situation in Ukraine and uh, faced a big question of whether we must continue to live in fear that nuclear weapons uh, might be used. First meeting uh, state parties is a historical turning point for nuclear abolition and the abolition of war. It is possible for citizens of the world to have solidarity with each other, with region each other to have discussions. Let's take action for peace together. Thank you all to participate in this session and please give a big hand to all speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if you all uh, interested in the Korean Fuan uh, Suyon's actions, please take your pictures and uh, sign for these papers. Thank you.
<laughs> Turn it on. Okay. Well, hi everybody. Um, we're short on time. Let's get started. 12:01. I'm actually not supposed to open the session, but I was. To, I, I didn't. I, I, I don't think we have a moderator, so I'm just going to kick it off. Um, we have a panel of three people. Uh, um, I let let them introduce uh, each of them themselves because I didn't prepare anything. Um, we have presentations of 10 minutes each, giving our remarks, and then we have a quick Q&A. So please make up your mind about questions, and then there's a QR code where you can put them online. We were told we're not supposed to take questions from the room, so please put them on the online tool, and then we can address them. Thanks, and over to Victor. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor. Okay. Um, Okay. Um. Well, did you get what I just said, or should I repeat it? Yeah. We'll we'll try to scream and do our best. Also, he has a ton of seats in the front. If you want to come closer, uh, please do so. Uh, okay. okay. Um, hi everyone. My name is Victor Chalashow. I'm a medical student for, uh, in Kenya. So I'll be the first presenter, and uh, along with me, I have. Uh... Yeah, I'll introduce myself. Okay. Okay. Carry on. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Ukraine war and uh, how it presents an existential threat, as well as the lessons that we can draw from from the ongoing war. Uh, I'm an international student representative for the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. I'm a senior medical student, and I'm not waiting to clear school so that I can start saving lives, and that's why I support the TPNW. So um, we're going to talk about the background of the war, um, the risk of escalations, what could happen uh, in case of a nuclear war, as well as what we can learn from that. So uh, just a little bit of context. Uh, the Ukraine war started in late February, as we all know, uh, with Russia con conducting a special military operation. Uh, now it's in its fourth month. So the Kremlin uh, launched the invasion to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. And uh, in his televised speech, uh, President Putin in the morning of invasion uh, spoke about the impossibility of reaching an agreement with NATO and was worried about uh, its expansion eastwards. Uh, I quote what he said is that, uh, as NATO expands to the east with every passing year, the situation for our country gets worse and more dangerous. Uh, moreover, in the recent days, the leadership of NATO has been openly talking about the need to speed up, force the advancement of the, of the alliance's infrastructure within the borders of Ukraine. Uh, they are doubling in their position and we can no longer just watch this happen. It would be responsible in our part. Furthermore, he added that anyone uh, that the problem, of course, is not NATO itself. It is only an instrument of US foreign policy. So from this statement, we can learn that uh, while the war is being physically fought uh, in Ukraine, the war is not by any means limited uh, to its borders. The war is, a, is an acute exacerbation of a larger rivalry between Russia, between Russia and NATO, and uh, it's not limited. Uh, in its current borders. Uh, for those of us who have, who have lived long enough, this is very reminiscent of the Cold War. Furthermore, he warned that anyone who, who tries to interfere with us should know that Russia's response will be immediate and lead, lead to such consequences that you have never seen in the history. So uh, this brings us to the next uh, question. What are the risks of escalation? And uh, what are some of the scenarios that can lead to a nuclear war? So. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, three possible scenarios, which I'll discuss, but of course, there are multiple. Uh, the most direct way uh, is if Putin accelerates a conventional battle to use nuclear weapons, uh, if he thinks it will give him an edge over the, uh, the Ukrainians in the, in, the, in, the, in the war zone. So in 2020, in 2020 Putin signed a decree um, under the basic principles of Russian Federation state policy, um, which I quote uh, says that the Russian Federation retains the right to use nuclear weapons in response to the use of uh, in response to the use of nuclear weapons and other types of weapons of mass destruction. But this is not a very um, uh, surprising. But what what was what is what caught my eye is the second part of the of the of that um, decree, which says that and also in the case of an aggression against the Russian Federation with the use of conventional weapons. So they can use nuclear weapons in response to a conventional uh, war. And then secondly, another scenario which can lead to a nuclear weapon is that you can, due to high tensions right now at the moment, you can have false alarm in one nation, uh, and they could misinterpret events such as training exercises, weather phenomenon, or even a malfunction, uh, not even to mention a terrorist cyber attack. 
uh, and uh, we've had six such scenarios and as more and more documents get declassified, uh, we get to know um, more of these events, uh, the most notable being the, the Cuban Missile class Crisis. Uh, the third scenario is uh, we can have the conflict spilling over to Poland. Um, and uh, this could be a deliberate attack on the NATO warehouses, which are, are shipping, uh, which are storing equipment that could be shipped to Ukraine. Um, just to quote the Article 5 of the NATO, which provides that, uh, if a NATO ally is the victim of an armed attack, each and every other member of the alliance will consider this an act of violence as an armed attack against all members and will take the actions that it deems necessary. So after this, we, we need to understand that should this happen, um, what are some of the uh, immediate effects of a nuclear war? So, um, within um, the most immediate effect uh, of, a nuclear of a nuclear war uh, is definitely uh, there will be an intense burst of nuclear radiation that will last uh, under second. So, within actually one thousandth of a second, there will be a fireball that uh, forming that will be a radius of two miles, and in this zone, the temperatures would be so high that what was cold, what was uh, solid material microseconds earlier becomes a gas hotter uh, than the sun's 15 million degree core, and any solid matter would be vaporized. Um, be it buildings, trees, vehicles, you name it, everything will be vaporized. Secondly, you'll have a, bi a fireball of superheated air uh, forming very rapidly, um, and uh, it will be two, uh, two miles in uh, diameter. So the, the fireball will gloss uh, very visibly from its own heat. Uh, it will be very, very um, bright that even uh, 50 miles away, it would, be, it would glow brighter than the sun. And then lastly, uh, so, so before that, you'll also have uh, a radius in, within a radius of four, of four miles in every direction. The, the blast will generate winds traveling at a speed of more than 400 miles per hour. And this would level any structure built by humans. And lastly, you'll have thermal flash uh, that will last uh, seconds and would ignite anything flammable, be it plastic, be it paper, be it wood. Um, and also to evidence this, um, two thirds of the victims from Hiroshima actually showed evidence of uh, flash burns. So earlier this year, uh, ICANN together with IPPNW uh, co-authored a report titled uh, No Place to Hide, Nuclear Weapons and the Collapse of Healthcare Systems. And it estimated just for Moscow I would like to highlight this to Moscow and as well as the United States because these are the largest talkers of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, is that in, in case of an attack in Moscow or even uh, Washington DC, uh, you'll have so many people injured. Um, for Moscow, you'll have uh, close to 251,000 people dying immediately as well as over a million being injured. Um, and for, for Washington DC, you could have close to uh, 180,000 people injured and uh, 300 and, uh, sorry, one, uh, 177 people could die immediately and uh, close to 380,000 uh, injured. So what this shows is that while um, nuclear, um, nuclear weapon states are so, uh, very, they're, they're very good at when it comes to developing and testing their weapons, but they're not uh, prepared when it comes to handling the consequences that arise from that. So this brings me to the next scenario. What could happen uh, with the ongoing war in Ukraine? Well. Uh, my favorite author, uh, Dr. George Friedman, says uh, the middle of a war is not the, the best place to draw conclusions. So you can, have, you can have this escalating to a nuclear war, or some, luckily, just by pure luck, uh, we can survive and uh, we can learn. So that what we can learn from this is that uh, we should uh, never be in such a position where we depend on luck to survive where our whole civilization, as you know it, our whole species uh, is uh, leaning on uh, just pure luck. So this, this is why the, it's quite crucial to have the TPNW. Uh, and the treaty uh, came into, into force in 2020. And uh, so far, we have uh, 62 state parties. Sorry, by the time I was making this, Guatemala had not yet signed. So, and uh, further, uh, we have close, close to 86, 86 uh, states have signed, but uh, not yet ratified. What is essential, furthermore, is that we need to remain hopeful. There is no time for negative thoughts, no time for bad energy. Uh, we have to stay hopeful, and uh, there are some of the instances where we can draw hope. Um, so, uh, close to 40 years ago, uh, immediately after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had uh, people taking to the streets all over the world, marching, calling for leaders in, this nuclear, in, in nuclear states to come together and make rational decisions so that we don't have, um, we're never in a scenario where 
uh, nuclear war is imminent. Secondly, we also have uh, polling that polling showed polling has showed uh, high levels of public support for TPNW uh, in nuclear weapon states as well as umbrella states. And also, recently, we've had governments that are supportive of the TPNW coming into power. Uh, very crucial. Uh, like the most recent example is. Uh, the example of Australia, where the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has expressed great uh, interest in the treaty, and we're very hopeful that maybe sometime in the future they may become the first nuclear weapon states uh, to, to adopt the treaty. So um, uh, IPPNW has uh, recognized the, the essence of the moment, and uh, in addition to just providing, uh, working with uh, other medical organizations to provide support to, in to those who are being uh, Injured, injured in Ukraine. We're also taking steps uh, to avoid uh, such an escalation of the scenario. So what you're doing, uh, IPPNW came up with a team with AVAS um, and also Nobel Peace Laureates to call for an immediate ceasefire and the withdrawal of all Russian military forces. Uh, so we came up with a um, with a petition which I would request all of you to sign if you have not yet signed. And so far we have reached actually over a million uh, signatures. And uh, also we released a joint, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, in addition to that, uh, we, we, we are, we're taking this as a teachable moment um, to educate the masses, to do research, to empower civil society organizations. Um, and uh, you can, IPPNW is affiliate all over the globe. Uh, for instance, the, the photo on the right here, these are uh, our affiliates in India who took it to the streets uh, to call uh, for the end of the war and also to resume dialogue. Uh, we also have some of the Chichamba moments which I would like to share with you. And uh, I would like to give you the example of Africa. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Africa is a nuclear weapon free zone of 54 states. And uh, I feel this confers us, uh, as Africans a right to lead the way when it comes to elimination of nuclear weapons, considering the impacts, the impacts that this has had on our people, and not to mention the, uranium, uh, the mining of uranium in DRC and the testing of nuclear weapons by France in Algeria. Um, and also, this was just some of what has happened and what would happen, and much more would happen uh, in the event of a nuclear weapon, which I'm not going to discuss uh, for now. Uh, Africa adopted the Treaty of Pelindaba, which, uh, which established the continent as, a, as the largest nuclear weapon free zone. Um, in addition to this, African countries have been very supportive of the TPNW, not just from the negotiations, not just from the signing, but also all the way to ratification. And I feel like the, the whole world should take an example of this. Um, in, the, in his address to the UN General Assembly in 1998, um, the the then president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela Madiba, uh, remarked that we must ask the question, which might sound so naive, sorry, which might sound so naive to those who have elaborated sophisticated arguments to justify their refusal of nuclear weapons. Why do, ne why do they need them anyway? Which is something that we don't understand. Uh, furthermore, I'd like to give you an example of the of, uh, youth, which uh, we can also learn. Um, uh, today, uh, the world is home to the largest population of the youth. So far, we are 1.8 billion people, and 90% of whom reside in developing countries, and we are the features of our society. So as a youth, I find it uh, very absurd that we are, the, we are the majority in the world. Power and decisions to threaten and, life, and end the life of others lies in the hands of some very few people. And I believe in the power of youth voices, and that we, young as we are, can and should change the world. We young people have a role in disarmament, and through activism, inclusivity, intergenerational dialogue, and collaboration, we can build a better world for ourselves and for future generations. I work with an extraordinary group of uh, young people at uh, Youth for TPNW to platform the voices of minorities to empower fellow youth through creating awareness and uh, to come up with brand new ways, innovative ways to spread the message of uh, peace. Um, we also Personally, I know not so many youth understand what TPNW is all about or even what nuclear weapons, uh, the, the threat that nuclear weapons threat to, pose to us. So we're taking this moment right now with the situation going on in Ukraine as a teachable moment. We're educating more and more youth and we're giving them power, uh, bringing them on the table to the dialogue. And uh, we have so many civil society organizations being led by the youth. Um, so with this, um, I just want to give you a take home message. Um, uh, and if, in case you forget everything I've said, just remember that we face the possibility of an extinction from the war in Ukraine, and we should take this as a teachable moment, and we have so many lessons to learn. 
but the key lesson is that political leaders, sorry, the political leaders don't care about you, me, or the rest of the world, as they have demonstrated time and again by their willingness to annex our future and those of coming generations to win short-term political games and uh, get favorable poll for elections. Whether we live or die totally depends on us, and the only tool to at the moment to readers of the outdated colonial and barbaric tools of mass destruction, that is nuclear weapons, is the TPNW. Let us wholeheartedly support this treaty locally and international, for it is the only hope that we have. Find your own way, um, identify your own strengths or your own interest in the TPNW and support it, support it in whichever way you can. By stigmatizing the bomb, as well as those who possess it, we can build a tremendous pressure for disarmament. I leave you with a quote uh, by Nelson Mandela, uh, which says, um, a, a world freed of nuclear weapons will be a, world f will be a freer world for all. Uh, thank you. Sorry. There it is. If you um, came in late, we were told that we were not going to take questions from the room. So if you have a question, you have to put it online. I hope you can figure out how you do that in the room, but I'll leave that to you. Uh, my name is Linda Pence-Gunter. I'm with an NGO uh, called Beyond Nuclear. We're based in Tacoma Park, Maryland, just outside Washington, DC. It's one of the first nuclear-free zones in the United States. It was formed in 1983. Um, this is a bit of a poignant moment for me personally to be here with this subject. Um, my family actually lived about three kilometers from here for 60 straight years until they were removed uh, to the death camps. And my father came to Washington in 1983 to hear Carl Sagan and uh, Paul Ehrlich introduce the concept of nuclear winter and realized that that concept had to be introduced to the UK audience, and so organized a nuclear winter tour in 1984 with uh, Richard Turco, who is, of course, one of the co-authors with uh, Carl Sagan, uh, Paul Ehrlich, who was the biologist who spoke at that conference, and Georgi Gadlitsyn, who was a Russian. They actually streamed uh, a couple of score of Russian scientists from Moscow at that conference, it was unprecedented. So it's rather bizarre to be uh, talking about nuclear winter uh, in a city that my family lived in, you know, because I, those are sort of two holocausts, but as Victor mentioned, they're still going on, most notably in the, in the Congo, where there are now at least five million dead as a result, mostly of wars over mineral, including uranium. So why am I here talking about nuclear power uh, when the subject is nuclear winter? And um, I'm going to get to that in the context of what's going on in Ukraine, because while we've been concerned about the threats of the possible use of nuclear weapons by Russia, there are, as my colleague Ira would say, 15 pre-deployed nuclear bombs sitting in Ukraine right now. They're commercial reactors, but um, they are enormous risks. So the two questions I'm going to be addressing uh, in the brief time we have are, one, you know, what are these risks? And two, why would this actually fit under the subject of nuclear winter? So the first thing to understand is that there are these 15 operational reactors in Ukraine and what's happened so far. And if you can, I hope you can see the map. I I'm supposedly can highlight things. I'll see if I can do that. Um, okay. So. In the south, if you look at the radiation symbols, that's on the left is where south Ukraine is, and on the right is Zaporizhia. And Zaporizhia has six reactors and is the biggest nuclear power plant, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe. And the radioactive inventories of Zaporizhia are significant. And what we've seen already so far was an attack on that plant by Russian forces where weaponry was fired and a building caught fire. Luckily, it wasn't one of the reactor buildings, but it was a close call. And then it became, and is still now, under the control of the Russian military. So it's a very uncertain situation. The IAE lost contact with them in terms of knowing what's going on, being able to measure any radioactive releases. And we've also seen uh, twice now that I know of 
Russian missiles in the war zone flying way too low over both Zaporizhia and the South Ukraine nuclear power plants, which presents a significant risk, and I'll get to what those could be shortly. So these are the scenarios of what could happen in a war zone with nuclear reactors, which is an unprecedented situation. <laughs> We've never had this before. And it can be something as simple as loss of power, because nuclear power plants don't power themselves. They rely on the grid. And so if they lose power, they start to get in trouble very quickly. So you don't even have to hit one of these things with a missile, and you don't have to hit the reactor. You could hit the switchyard. If they lose power, then you start to get a situation where you can't cool the reactor or the fuel pools. And that becomes very critical quickly because fuel pool fires, explosions, and meltdowns are what would release the radioactive inventory, which is actually radioactively hotter in the pools where the fuel has been taken out of the reactor than what's in the reactor itself. And those are sitting unprotected, not inside the containment of the reactor and would release masses of radiation. What you have to think about is, and I'm going to compare this with Chernobyl, is what happened after Chernobyl and how orders of magnitude worse this could be. Also, you have just the conflagration of war and evacuations. If you've got a war raging around a nuclear power plant, you can't evacuate the workforce from that nuclear power plant because without them, it's going to get critical and melt down. So, but they may want to evacuate if they're in the middle of a conflagration, so that presents problems. And then there's the issue of fighting back. When Zaporizhia was attacked the first time, they, they, the Ukrainians did not fight back. And what we assumed was they realized that fighting back could escalate the situation. Since then, there have been statements that have come out saying, no, we just weren't ready. We didn't expect it. Next time, we're fighting back. So that's you know, understandable, but it's also going to make the situation infinitely more dangerous. It could be not necessarily a deliberate attack on a nuclear power plant. We sort of hope and pray that even Putin would not be crazy enough to do this. We can't be sure, but it doesn't have to be deliberate. As we've seen with these missiles flying low, it could just be accidental. So they really are sitting duck pre-deployed bombs. And how bad it could be, and that list uh, of the reactors just shows you how many they are, how big they are, and how old they are. And that speaks to the question of how bad it could be, is obviously it depends on how many reactors and or fuel pools were hit. If it's one, it won't be as bad as three but it's still going to be extremely bad. It depends on the fuel inventories, but as you can see from the dates of operation, when they were connected to the grid, these reactors all been running for a very long time, and so their fuel inventories are significantly high. It depends on the severity, how much, is it a fuel, part, fuel pool part fire, or is it a reactor breach, you know, what actually gets out. And of course, it depends on which way the wind's blowing, who gets the worst of it. And that really takes me to sort of the Chernobyl comparison. Because Chernobyl tends to have all the publicity because it had the big disaster in 1986 and everybody's heard of it. And so when this uh, invasion first started, we heard mostly about Chernobyl, also because it was the first nuclear power plant to be occupied. The troops came in from Belarus, they went into the Chernobyl zone, as we know, and um, occupied it. But what we have to understand is what happened at Chernobyl in 1986 informs the risks of what could happen today. And what happened in 1986 was pretty bad. You know, that's the fallout map. And so all of that is fallout, but the red, the darker areas are the greater amounts of fallout. And as you can see, it's not consistent. It didn't just get less the further away you got. There were hot spots depending on which way the wind was blowing and where it rained. And it released probably as much as 200 million curies. And that is 400 times more radioactive elements than were released by the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So that's gonna bring me to the point I'm gonna make shortly about how seriously we need to take this in the context of saying, well, nuclear weapons are really horrible, maybe nuclear power plants are kind of benign and we can accept them for climate change and so forth. No, not at all. So you're looking at potentially 
something increment, you know, much worse. But let's just look at what happened then. So 40% of the land area of Europe outside of Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine was significantly contaminated with radioactive fallout. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of avoidable deaths. There's all sorts of debates about how many people actually died, will have died, could die. But the fact is that it affected hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, not just about deaths, because that's not the only thing that matters. And it's critical when we talk about nuclear power. The longevity of the isotopes that get out and the amount of time they continue to harm people is decades. So that's quite different in many ways to a nuclear weapons attack. And then you've got countless th sickened, not just killed, especially thyroid cancer, and lots of places that you can no longer go. You know, they're just permanently exclusion zones. And now we have Chernobyl in a war zone. They were there for the, a month, the Russian troops. They occupied it, they looted it. Uh, the operators of Chernobyl lost a lot of equipment. Now, why are their operators still at Chernobyl? It's got four, clo well, three, one destroyed, three closed reactors. The fuel is still on site. It is quite a bit cooler thermally and radioactively than the fuel at the operating reactors. So it's not as dangerous as the 15 operating reactors, but it's not safe. So a fire at Chernobyl could still be a devastating effect. Look, they still have problems with loss of power because they still have to cool that fuel. And they did have a loss of power because of the invasion and occupation for a few days where they had to rely on backup diesel generators, which is the case also at the operating reactors, which don't last forever. So it's a tenuous situation. And it's also an area of wildfires, sometimes sadly deliberately started. And fire is the number one risk at any nuclear power plant. So that, when you've got a war going on, there's going to be fires. So that's also a grave risk. And then, as we know, the Russian troops themselves were not really told. There were a lot of young kids there who were not really told, never heard of probably Chernobyl disaster, where they were, and dug trenches, kicked up a lot of dust. So that redistributes the radioactivity, which is all on the topsoil, back into the atmosphere and, and makes that area even more radioactive than it's been for a while, not to mention the fact that they themselves got dosed, and by all accounts, some of them have already fallen sick. So that's the Chernobyl situation today. So what has this got to do with nuclear winter? Well, the, the issue really is that the amount of radioactivity that would get out of one of these older reactors compared to Chernobyl, which on that slide you saw had only been running for just over two years. So Unit 4 did not have a huge radioactive entry. The amount of radioactivity that would get out and the longevity of the isotopes that would get out would mean that you would render large areas of land highly contaminated and unusable for potentially decades or more. And as we know already, Ukraine is one of the chief wheat suppliers to the world. And so you're looking at starvation issues, not just there, but also in terms of the markets they supply. It would force a mass dislocation, just as a nuclear war would do. And when you have that, um, you decimate, obviously, workforces, the economy. You know, nothing is going to function if millions of people have to flee, which they would if that level of radioactivity got out from any of these 15 plants. You, that then overwhelms hospitals and medical staff, just as we know in a nuclear war, really, the medical staff, there's no way you can cope with it. This would be an overwhelming problem, which we've already seen with COVID. And it would overwhelm other countries with refugees, which doesn't always go well, depending on the color of your skin, obviously. But, you know, that's also a problem in terms of the mass migrations of people. And it will cause prolonged harm. But what we've seen even from Chernobyl is not only decades long suffering, people continuing to live in areas of contamination, either eating or not able to eat uh, the food that's contaminated. But we've seen it passing down generations. So inherited problems with DNA changes and genetic changes. And so there are children born with problems relating to the Chernobyl disaster who were not alive during the Chernobyl disaster, but their parents or their grandparents were. So that's a bit like an a nuclear, it, you know, we don't have the darkness, we don't have the cold, but you have some of the societal problems that are the same or similar to a nuclear winter. So, 
The reason I've raised this and the reason I'm here actually is to say that we must start, when we talk about nuclear weapons, we need to talk about nuclear power at the same time. It isn't this benign stepchild that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it isn't just an electricity generator. It is a weapon of mass destruction. And the risk, it's just like nuclear deterrence, which, can, uh, which I don't believe in, obviously, and which can only work if it has a zero percentage of failure, right, of, of success. You have to have a zero percentage that any, nothing can go wrong with nuclear deterrence, otherwise it's game over. The same is the issue with nuclear power. The risk that we're willing to take to have this kind of electricity electricity generator now in a war zone that could contaminate vast areas of Europe and beyond, way worse than Chernobyl, and 10 times at least worse than Chernobyl, and say that that's okay is not okay. And, and the other thing is that when you think of the beginning of the, you know, the chain and what the TPNW is about, which is about the humanitarian impacts, right, of nuclear weapons. Those begin at the beginning of the chain with uranium miners. And those people, for them, it makes no difference whether they're mining the uranium for nuclear weapons or nuclear power. The harm that they suffer, the, con the discrimination they suffer, the lack of resources they suffer are identical. And it's almost always on indigenous lands or in communities of color. So when we slam the door shut, each time we try to slam the door shut on nuclear weapons development, if we leave the other door open to this inalienable right to develop safe, peaceful nuclear energy, which it is none of those things, we continue to sort of sabotage the opportunity to rid ourselves from nuclear weapons. And that's the problem that we face. And the, and the curious thing is, why is it even in there? Now, I know that it's complicated and that there's a sort of haves and have not issue, but when you think of countries that say they need nuclear energy, like Iran, for example, or Saudi Arabia, if they really need a, co a consolation for not developing nuclear weapons that is an electricity provider, why would they choose nuclear power when clearly it's much more expensive, much slower, much more dangerous, and if you're Saudi Arabia, you've got tons of sun and wind. So it's not about that. It's about having the possibility of, de of developing nuclear weapons. And this strange fascination fascination with that there's something prestigious about having something nuclear and that we'll be okay with it being nuclear power plants but not nuclear weapons is a mindset that we need to change not only out there with the governments but with our, within our own movement because we tend to be quite siloed, uh, especially in the US. I'm a disarmament person, I'm an anti-nuclear power person and we need to marry those movements together and change the culture as one movement. Because we shouldn't just worry about the top picture, which is horrific enough. That's a victim from Hiroshima. We should worry about the bottom picture, which is a woman with what's called the Chernobyl necklace. That's the scar you have after you have your thyroid removed if you suffered from thyroid cancer. And no one should have to endure that. So I'll just wrap up here, because I'm probably overrun, sorry, to say that that's who I am. And if you want to get in touch with us, uh, we have uh, a website, obviously, beyondnuclear.org. We also have a sort of magazine website called beyondnuclearinternational.org. If you have a story to tell, you want to submit an essay, an uh, article, please send them to me, because we're always looking for interesting stories from other parts of the world, especially, that we don't hear about every day. So thank you so much, and we'll, we'll check on the questions after Jonas is done. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonas Jägermeier. I'm with Columbia University and NASA in New York City. We are actually supposed to be in the Q&A already, so I'm going to speed up um, and um, try to highlight um, an issue of food security. The most uh, important indirect effects of a nuclear war are probably on agriculture and global food security. So I want to highlight some of the research we've been doing in this regard. Um, before Ukraine and Russia um, came into conflict, so we are looking at slightly different results that are somewhat transferable, and we can talk about that in a second. Um, 
How's this going to work? Forward is the middle one. No. There we go. So I'm uh, actually, I'm at Columbia. I'm leading a global crop modeling team. We are, we are running models to simulate what climate perturbations and climate change is doing to global crop growth, um, usually in face of uh, climate change, of warming. And then recently, we were uh, encouraged to work on this topic from a different perspective, um, uh, initiated by Richard Turker uh, that we just saw, Ira uh, and Alan Roebuck. And he invited us as crop modeling specialists to look at this question that it's been addressed on kind of like a back of the envelope thing in a more elaborate way to use multi-model ensembles, state-of-the-art crop modeling, climate science, to drill down and, and see, uh, understand what's actually happening in a regional or limited nuclear exchange or war. Because these all-in scenarios are pretty clear, it's devastating, but what happens if there is a regional conflict between India and Pakistan with some of their arsenal, is that already enough to see an indirect global signal? And that's what I want to um, show to you. So in 2019, um, some screenshots here, you know, India and Pakistan had several skirmishes, uh, uh, traditional wars, have a significant arsenal in, in, with nuclear weapons and no, dis, uh, 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 no first uh, strike treaty. So there, uh, many uh, experts ex uh, saw this conflict as one of the most dangerous to escalate. So we've looked at a scenario um, people put together um, in terms of how many warheads would be used, what targets are, are, are uh, on the table. Um, so in that kind of scenario, using 50, we call it Hiroshima-sized bombs of, uh, um, uh, you know, 20 to 50 of these bombs on, on each side, um, would generate a, a global cooling of about 1.8 degrees Celsius for five years. This gray bar, I don't know if you can actually see it, is a five-year average. So a 1.8 degrees Celsius is comparable to what we talk about in, 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 in climate change with the Paris Accord, you know, 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. So that's a significant amount uh, uh, of cooling that we're talking here. And it's a very characteristic sharp decline after the conflict with a gradual uh, recovery over 10 to 15 years, actually. So in, in a, a, the size of the scenario uh, uh, is actually not a lot compared to the, the global arsenal. So this is using 0.7% of the global arsenal and about 30% of what uh, India and Pakistan is, uh, are expected uh, to actually have deployed. Now, if we convert that in a signal of global food production, running multiple crop models, forest with different climate scenarios, uh, studying this in detail, we see a very similar response in, in shape to the temperature signal, sharp decline in year one uh, and gradual recovery over five years. Uh, average, we're talking about a 12 to 13 percent global decline in here maize production, but similar for other crops. Now, if we look at this at country level, stratified for different countries, please excuse this very small figure, um, but the, the, the point is clear. There is a strong geographic gradient. Higher latitudes growing crops will be, uh, will be more affected here, shown on the, on the average yield map in the center, than tropical countries. And that's just because higher latitudes uh, uh, are temperature limited, so additional uh, cooling will be harmful for global, global crop growth. And in the tropics, it can actually be, you can actually find regions that might benefit from slight cooling. And on the flip side, um, uh, global warming is actually showing a reverse signal, which uh, hits uh, uh, lower latitude countries and uh, uh, tropical countries the hardest. Um, the, now I'm getting technical for a second and then I'm opening up again. So the beauty of modeling is that we can decompose different factors. So we can now try to understand what causes these effects. So we are forcing the crop models with individual climate drivers 
uh, one at a time. And here we're looking at the, the, the response from changing air temperature only, or only precipitation changes, or only short wave variation changes. Um, and what we learn is that temperature is uh, introducing this geographic gradient, because that's where uh, the bread baskets are located. Uh, precipitation and short wave variation also change but induce a more homogeneous response. And in general, these factors add up pretty linearly to about 12% uh, under this kind of five teragram scenario, India and Pakistan. Um, note that we um, take out India and Pakistan from these analyses and maps. We are assuming um, we are only interested in the indirect global effects. Um, so we're not including any uh, radioactive contamination, uh, infrastructure, and, and, and labor requirements, and all that. So I address global warming for a second. This, this is a quick sketch to just relate and make the point that cooling is actually more harmful to global crop growth than warming. Um, these figures aren't directly comparable because it's different studies, different setups, and so forth. But the point is clear. Um, Cooling is more harmful because global bread baskets are located generally the high productive areas at higher latitudes where, harming, uh, where, where cooling is very harmful. Now global warming comes with other factors, for example, higher CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, which is beneficial for crop growth. Long-term gradual change can uh, allow you to adapt and develop strategies to change and, 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 and do different, differently. But cooling is, uh, due to a nuclear war is, is, is abrupt. And you, you don't have the capacity to, to do much about it overnight, switch to different plants, shift around seats, uh, change infrastructure. All of that um, limits adaptation capacity and leads to the fact that global cool, uh, cooling is more harmful. Now let's look uh, on my last two slides on the market responses real quick. Um, so overall, five-year average, we talk about you know, 11% now different crops combined. The, the four big global staple crops, maize, wheat, soybean, and rice. The highest impact is actually in year four, post-conflict. And if you relate that to historical variation, the black bold bar in the, behind the red bar is the, the standard deviation uh, of historical variability. So um, we're going far outside that, that range with that, uh, such a signal. And in fact, the largest historical anomaly since the recordings of the FAO started in 1961 uh, was in 2012, um, minus 4.6% anomaly of these four crops. And these models suggest that even a regional war nuclear war with these assumptions will lead uh, uh, to an, a global effect uh, almost three times larger than what we've experienced historically. Um, on this very last slide, just um, I want to bring in the topic of um, food reserves and stocks. Um, what we call is uh, uh, the, the ratio of what a country has in demand and was, what it holds in stocks is the stocks to use ratio. Um, now bear with me, the map shows what is currently in stock. Um, so countries like the US, Australia, China hold up to 20 or more percent of their annual demand in stock, and other countries, especially Africa, much less. Now if we simulate these kind of like market disturbance, uh, including food trade, um, uh, trade barriers, and so on, we see a decline in global food stocks in year one, which however buffer any major effect on food availability at domestic level, which you can interpret as uh, 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 what people actually have accessible, or if you want, starvation. So in year one, stocks uh, and reserves buffer any food security, direct food security effects. However, then, by year four, uh, stocks deplete virtually in all countries, and continuing production losses, because the, the climate perturbation is still ongoing, directly feed uh, into food security issues, um, uh, reducing uh, food accessibility uh, in many global countries, especially in the South, 
So trade propagates production losses to the global south. Um, to wrap up with the main messages of uh, uh, nuclear war and global food security, a regional war, a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan is actually much, has much larger effects on global food security than what we have uh, expected before. Um, production losses are located in higher latitudes and trade in the global food system at, uh, uh, dispro uh, 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 propagates that to the global south, dis disproportionately affecting um, uh, importing countries. Um, food reserves can buffer some of the effects, but not in the long term. And uh, trade barriers that I haven't really um, gone into here um, will actually uh, uh, make these effects much worse uh, as countries will stop exporting uh, grain uh, crops before um, cutting into their own um, supply. Limitations to this, as mentioned before, we're, we're not assuming any adaptation changes in management and so forth. Uh, 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 labor availability is assumed to be there. All of these factors will make, will render this a conservative estimate um, and uh, uh, locally uh, realities might be much worse than what we're seeing here. And again, this is one snapshot scenario that we stylized to understand uh, and disentangle these factors a little bit, but it all comes with um, your assumptions of uh, the, the fuel load of the locations where you assume uh, these uh, warheads to detonate. So there's large uncertainty um, among these scenarios. So you can go higher or lower, but this is one marker scenario to, to, to highlight some of these effects that link globally. Thank you very much. So we're running a little low on time, so we thought we'd just quit, but we did start late. <laughs> so we thought we'd answer maybe a couple of parts of these questions, if that's okay. And, and you should look and see if there's one that you want to answer. Sure, if, if I'm, you I'm saw gonna, one that yeah, speaks I, to you, you can go ahead. I was gonna just quickly address the, um, you know, somebody, I think it was David, who asked whether there are already environmental effects from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And the answer to that is very much so yes. And it's been very much noticed uh, in the, the wildlife and nature around the area. And I will direct you to the work of Dr. Tim Mousseau, uh, who has looked at this in depth. But fundamentally, one of the things that's happened is that because of the exposure to radioactivity, the uh, trees don't fall. Uh, when the trees fall, they don't decay. The microbes that make decay happen are not there. So the forest floors have become sort of tinder boxes um, because nothing is decaying. Uh, what he's found in, and he's looked in Chernobyl as well as Fukushima, you know, barn swallows who are sterile, who have cataracts on their eyes, can't feed, so forth. So shortened lifespans, you know, there's lots of stories about you know, abundance of wildlife in Chernobyl, but if you look at their medical conditions, uh, that's kind of a false flag about what's actually happening. And then there was a quick question, I think, about uranium mines and whether they should come under international control. And obviously, my opinion on uranium mines is they should be closed permanently, uh, that we shouldn't control something. We can't control, we should shut them down because we need to keep uranium in the ground. Are there any... I, I don't see a question that directly addresses my field. Um, I see a question on uh, uh, can we communicate the risks we're facing? And I mean, that's why we're all here, right? I mean, it's all about communication of the science, uh, disseminating our results, and we're trying our best. But at the end of the day, we are scientists, or I am. I'm a scientist. I'm truly academic, uh, trying my best to, to, to put these results out. But it's all of us, that's why we're here, about disseminating these kind of results, uh, communicating that, uh, um, what I was saying, um, nuclear winter is not an outdated concept. Um, there is risk associated with even uh, small nuclear escalations. And as long as these bombs are available, the risk uh, won't go away. Um, I think that's, that's the important message. Yeah.
And a quick clarification, this was a question that kind of vanished, but um, <laughs> it was saying that, you know, you can't talk about nuclear power uh, in the same breath as nuclear winter. And that's true. I, I want to clarify, I didn't say that if the 15 reactors had a disaster in Ukraine, it would be a nuclear winter. But this was the subject I got <laughs> for my panel. And so what I was trying to do was sort of make it fit in terms of some of the upshots. You know, some of the things that would happen would be similar things that happen when a nuclear winter happens, but it wouldn't be, you know, darkness and cold. So that's just a quick clarification. All right, so we are five minutes over time. I think uh, lunch is ready. Uh, I guess so. Oh, there's another session. Okay, never mind. Um, I think we all had our contact out here, so please reach out if, if you want to engage, if you have questions. Um, I'm more than happy to discuss further details. Uh, come up and approach us, and thanks for your uh, presence and attention.
it's working. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. They don't know us, right? We didn't pay them to cheer. So this is Imad Kiai from Iran. I'm Sharon Dolev from Israel. Um, as you can see, an Iranian and Israeli working together to get rid of nuclear weapons. Thanks. Now, we don't think that we deserve any cheers. We were just happened to be born where we were born, right? So, so I would have preferred to have been born closer to here in Vienna, but you know, as an Iranian, it is what it is. <laughs> so we came to talk to you today about how to disarm the world, not just the Middle East, but let's start from the Middle East. So in 2007, I started a campaign in Israel with Greenpeace, and later on, because Greenpeace a few months later decided to stop working on disarmament, um, I had to start a new NGO in Israel called the Israeli Disarmament Movement, IDM. And um, with IDM, with this idea, I went to the UN in 2008, in a year after I started the campaign. One day I'll have time to tell you the stories of how, to, how do you campaign in the ambiguous Israel on nuclear weapons. But in 2008, I went to the UN and I heard an amazing lecture by Stephen Starr from IPPNW. The lecture was called 100 Hiroshima's. What happens if there is a small-scale war between India and Pakistan? What you now recognize as the humanitarian impact of nuclear war. But then that was not the name yet. When I heard Stephen Starr showing what might happen if there's a small nuclear war between India and Pakistan, I knew immediately that I have the campaign for Israel. This is a great opportunity to talk to Israelis about how to disarm or why there is a need, sorry, not how, why there is a need to disarm Israel. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the Israel that I want to disarm. I want to disarm all nine nuclear states. I don't care if they're inside the NPT or outside the NPT, if they're P5 or North Korea. No state should have nuclear weapons. It was quite obvious when you look at the states that Russia will not disarm unless the US will disarm. When I came back to Israel and we talked about all nine nuclear armed states, it was quite obvious at some point that for Israel, there's no adversary, no nuclear adversary. So if you want, if you have a good story about why the world needs to disarm, and yet you're talking in a state that possesses nuclear weapons and you want people to be willing to think about not just that it is important to disarm, which everybody agreed once they heard what will happen if there is a small nuclear war, the next step is how do you disarm safely? For Israel, we found a solution, a regional solution. It was quite obvious that for Israel it's impossible to disarm unless it feels secure to do so within the Middle East. However, every time we went to international arenas, every time we saw panels talking on the zone, on the, on the nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, then the weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, the one thing that we kept hearing was impossible, impossible. People were talking in panels after panels after panels. 90% of the panels were Western or European people talking about the Middle East without not even one Middle Eastern on the stage. Describing always the past, the 95 NPT resolution, if you don't know what it is, I'll talk about it later, and getting till now. Nobody talked about how to disarm or how to bring the zone. In 2014, we were able to start doing roundtables in Israel with the help of international, like Paul Ingram from BASIC, Patricia Lewis that assisted us, and, and others from PAX and other organizations came to Israel so we can, have, so we can hold roundtables. Following those roundtables, we did meetings in UN meetings, in the sidelines, in back doors, back rooms, with some of the players from the zone. Not easy task for an Israeli and for an Iranian to talk with Arab diplomats and gain trust. 
when we finished mapping all the obstacles, why is it, why is it that people keep believing that a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East is impossible? And why, why do states keep talking about it without a solution? And when we asked for possible solutions, we kept hearing impossible. Even to write a text that will describe, describe a weapon of mass destruction free zone was not just impossible, but we even got some warnings, it's dangerous. If we don't have much time, so in the Q&As, if, if you want to know more about that, we will be happy to tell. However, when we started mapping all the obstacles, we realized that if you put all the obstacles in columns of what can be solved and what cannot be solved, we came up almost as an accident with the first draft treaty for a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. And we thought, if that's the case, why do they think it's impossible? And we realized that the one thing that was lacking was goodwill. You're talking about something that you don't believe can happen. This is when we decided to call our campaign Achieving the Possible. We started with draft treaty after draft treaty, bringing the diplomats from the zone, bringing some experts like Tarek Rauf here. Hi, Tarek to look at the draft treaty that we, I mean, we ourselves, as the authors of the first draft and second draft, we could hardly believe that we have a text that might work. We went to the UN to, in 2016, 17, was it? Uh, I think it was here in Vienna, yeah, when we introduced the first draft treaty. It was groundbreaking in the way that we could sit in front of the diplomats and say one thing, from now on, since you all received this draft treaty, and of course they all received the draft treaty, not from an Iranian or from an Israeli, they received it from a British guy, of course, a British man, that was our front man, and when they received it, diplomats actually said, oh, it's a possibility. This text might work, it might work. From that on, we could have roundtables with the diplomats. We called it a second track, one and a half track. We had to build trust with the diplomats. We had to secure the diplomats' identities, not just Chatham House rules, never to say who was in the room, uh, and keep that even though lots of people wanted to know who's in the room. During COVID, we managed to continue our work on Zoom, which was also amazing because it meant that there's a lot of trust now with those diplomats. And we now have four different draft treaties. It's impossible now to say that it is impossible to reach a WMD free zone in the Middle East because there are already four different possibilities on how to do it. Um, and you're all welcome to our website in order to see the draft treaties. To make it even better, in 2018, at the General Assembly, the states voted on a yearly conference, we call it shortly the November conference, a, conf a UN conference that's supposed to uh, have all states in the region to come up with a text, a text which is a treaty, freely arrived at, that they can all agree on. From 24 states, in the Middle East, which are 22 Arab states, Iran and Israel, 23 of the states have already participated in two of these yearly UN conferences. The one state that, it does, that doesn't come or respond is, of course, Israel. Now, usually when you talk about a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, or when people talk about the Middle East, they don't really talk about the Middle East, they talk about Israel. When people say that they want a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, they want to disarm Israel. Fair enough. I also want to disarm Israel. Who here comes from a nuclear weapon state? Doesn't matter if it's inside or... Can you... Higher? I can't see much. Brilliant. How many of you think that your state will be willing to be the first one to disarm? <laughs> Who? 
think. And yet, the conversation was always about how to disarm Israel. You call it <laughs> weapon of mass destruction, but let's be honest. Now, the campaign in Israel, surprisingly enough, is going well when it's going. When we tell people what is the danger of nuclear weapons, how close, it, how close we were several times to have nuclear war, what will be the impact if Israel will ever use nuclear weapons, people in Israel are actually with us. They want to disarm, but they do need a regional solution in order to feel secure. But they also need something else. They need to know that they are not the only state being pursued. Rightly so. So if we want to disarm Israel, the best way to do it is to disarm the world, right? We need to show that we're not just calling Israel to disarm. We need to show that all nine states are being pursued. Right? All nine states, all nine states need to show commitment for disarmament. Five of the nuclear armed states are at the NPT, the P5, they're at the NPT under a commitment for disarmament. Now, how come 77 years after the first commitment, 1945, and how many years after the NPT was established? Sorry, I didn't sleep tonight. How many? 50 years, thank you. That the second, or that we have NPT meetings, and we are not standing there pushing these states to uphold to their commitment. They actually made a commitment that the other four didn't. So if you think about disarming Israel, you can't do it without a nuclear push on all nuclear states. However, just to push them, we'll annihilate them. We'll push them back. We don't want them just being feel like they're being pushed to do something that is not safe for them. Who has nuclear power and wants to give it up. Nobody wants to give up power freely. So what we want to do now in METO, and then I'll, push it to, I'll pass it to Imad, now we are asking you, who come from nuclear armed states, and who work with nuclear armed states or work around the world, to work with us. Let's find solutions, like we found for Israel. Let's find solutions together. Let's write for them the treaties that they might need. Our draft treaty, according to diplomats in the room, and remember, these are Arabs and Iranians that are receiving material from an Iranian and Israeli. They know so. And they said that our draft treaty carved years of negotiation. <coughs> Sorry, negotiation. We're asking you to do the same. We're asking you to, you, we know that some of you already did that. Some of you already imagined how your state can join any talks. What will reduce the tension? How to imagine that this zone or this or your zone or your state can disarm safely? So what we are asking you to join us in doing now, on one hand, to push together, all of us, those states that possess nuclear weapons, to declare a timeline for disarmament. We would like them to start taking measures. First, we need to push them for no first use. We need to push them, not because we believe that no first use is helpful, but because we need to remind people that as long as there's nuclear weapons, they cannot sleep quietly. We need to push for nuclear disarmament while pushing for solutions, not just disarm, how to disarm. When it comes to the Middle East, in the TPNW, you need to remember that disarmament is not dismantlement. Disarmament starts with the conversation. The November conference, where the states are, the disarmament in the Middle East started. It's already started. You want to bring the Middle East states to the TPNW? Support that. Acknowledge the disarmament in the Middle East started and bring your own states for the same um, mechanism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. As you have heard, Middle East Treaty Organizations 
primary goal is to establish a WMD free zone in the Middle East. That includes nuclear weapons. The way we go about it is a lessons learned in terms of how we can then approach this to other places in the world. There can be a regional approach, there can be a national approach, and of course, our international push. So it's about time, the timeline for disarmament is our new campaign that aims to showcase the fact that all nuclear weapon states have to be targeted from grassroots to policy to advocacy and to take action through our activism again. We need to revive that spirit of activism that led to a lot of other treaties that are here today, including the TPNW. So the road ahead is still long, but now we have many other new instruments and new uh, tools at our hand. One of them, like when it comes to the Middle East Treaty Organization, is our draft treaty process. I just want to touch on some of the activities that we do so that you have a better understanding how we're going about this in one of the most volatile regions in the world, where there is tensions between Iran and Israel, where there is development of other nuclear programs across the region, may that be in Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, not to mention the advanced program in Iran and Israel's nuclear weapons program and arsenal. So here, we take about six different work streams that makes up our work. First and foremost is our citizen advocacy and diplomacy. This is the stuff that we do when we take our draft treaty to the international disarmament forums and we discuss it with every government we can get our hands on so that they know that there is actually a pathway forward, that there is a solution on the table, that it can be discussed, that there is a roadmap, and that product is the draft treaty. The draft treaty itself creates a climate of trust and capacity building, but also a conversation amongst adversaries. We do that through uh, roundtables, expert meetings, where we bring international experts, regional experts on the topic of WMD disarmament and security, and we match them with those who are in the policy world, who have been in government, or are still in there and present in these closed door meetings in their personal capacity. It is phenomenal what we can do in four days. Let me give you a quick example. We had one of these meetings in Zurich. The first day, some of those presents coming from countries that don't even recognize each other. You know who I'm talking about, the Iranians, the Israelis, the Saudis, and elsewhere. By day three, by them focusing on a solution, this draft treaty is not that we're saying you got to implement it. We're just saying this is a conversation starter that there is a way we can actually address what does dismantlement look like? What does verification look like? What does inspection mean? How do we go about even categorizing this? What geographical area are we looking at? All of those things and the capacity within the region to be able to push this through. By day three, believe me, the Israeli, the Iranian, the Saudi are talking about their grandchildren. They're talking about their hobbies. By day four, they're hugging each other. And instead of saying your draft treaty, they said, we have to protect our process of bringing about solutions. We know that when we reach at that human level, there's a way for us to move forward. The Middle East can do it. And if the Middle East can do it, there's no other reason for you, Cocos, anywhere else in the world, <laughs> all right? that you can say, oh, I don't know if I can do this. No, in your countries, you got to get on it. Now, the draft treaty, through these talks and experts, we draft it and it's constantly evolving so that we can account for the realities in the region. So we're not detached from what's happening on the ground. If there is a development, let's say there's a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, fantastic, let's sneak that in. So it means that they're on parallel tracks, whatever is actually moving forward on disarmament, security, and peace will feed into our grand goal of achieving such a zone. In addition to our citizen diplomacy and our draft treaty process, we also do public outreach. This is one of the examples of our public outreach. We make sure that we get the message as wide as possible to as many people so that they know that in this region, there are people like Sharon, myself, and our wonderful team at Meto that are working every day to make this goal achievable. Right over there, <laughs> our gang. In addition to that, we have our university network because we believe that the students of today are going to be and are 
going to be the leaders of our future. And we've got to make sure that they keep nuclear disarmament, WMD dismantlement, and all of that at the top of their mind as they go in their professional careers. And so we have our educational program, we have this fantastic network across the world of universities and their students who then feed into our work in METO. And they lead many of our sub-projects that are Fantastic. Ayushi here deals with our humanitarian um, uh, impact of WMDs in the region because, mind you, weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons specifically, have been used in the region the most after the Second World War. So these survivors, like the Hibakusha, are powerful voices to make sure and remind us of what the impact of these weapons are on our bodies, on our societies, on our environment. We have others like the remapping project that looks at the Middle East from a new perspective, that these borders were drawn up a century ago by colonial powers that divided this region. We have a choice to look at it again with fresh eyes, what security means and what the future of this region by the people in what they see as human security, but also incorporating their state securities. We're looking at Bright Side, which is a fantastic newsletter that I encourage you all to sign up to that showcases the good news coming from the Middle East. Because I know that when you think of the Middle East, you just see carnage, you see violence, but that's not the truth. There's a lot of people, a lot of organizations, every day working to advance peace, security, and prosperity in the region. So that newsletter gives me hope, and I'm sure will give you. In addition to all of that, in addition to all of that, our grand, grand vision ahead is not just a WMD-free zone in the Middle East. This is the start. We believe that if there is consensus and improvement and movement on such a difficult security matter, it definitely will open up as a gateway to discuss other pressing issues facing the region. Ultimately, we hope that we can create a Middle East Union or the basis of it, shaped off exactly like the European Union. Because I tell you, when the idea of the European Union was planted in 1953, after the Second World War, after the Europeans had butchered millions of each other, few believed that it would be a reality today. And so we believe, we see the vision already, we are living that future already, that the Middle East can again be a beacon of hope, can be again a place where civilization flourished, mathematics, sciences, and philosophy. And so, Join us on this grand journey, and I hope that you will visit our website on wmd-free.me. You can get involved, volunteer, join our university network, learn about how you can do an array of goodies, and on top of that, get the message out. If we can do it in the Middle East, the disarmament has already begun, as Sharon said, through these conversations, through these activities. I know that we can get there, but we need all of you on board for the Middle East and for the rest of the world. Because nukes going off in one of the most volatile regions in the world will not spare you in Vienna, Tokyo, or Moscow. So join us, and I hope that we can answer your questions right away. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, it's a workshop. Let's work. <laughs> Any questions? Don't be shy. No questions. Yeah. Please don't take questions from the room. Please ask questions on Slido and Uh-oh. All right. Our bosses in the back have mentioned that you have to write it or something. Oh. Sorry, I didn't understand. This has to go through this thing. Oh. I see. So meanwhile, yes. Meanwhile, hey Sharon, how are you doing? I'm 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 almost uh, fainting here, but fine. So you uh, know this is kind of crazy, huh? An Iranian and Israeli. You've been watching the news. You know, our rep res uh, respective governments are literally not only in a cold war; it's become a very warm and hot war of assassinations, sabotage, and so forth. And these are dire times where things can go increasingly wrong. From the dismantlement of the JCPOA right now on life support to 
the expanding nuclear program of Iran that has now reached 60% enrichment of uranium. Now that is very close to a weapons grade. We need to be able to change that discourse. So Sharon, how are we going to do it? So, one thing that is missing for me, two things that are missing for me. Um, we are, we, uh, and, and I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm criticizing. We are a campaign organization. ICANN is not an organization. It's a campaign coalition working together in order to annihilate nuclear weapons. But we don't have enough training in nonviolent direct actions, in getting the media and leave the diplomatic holes. And I think it's time for us to go back to the streets, reminding people how scary nuclear weapons should be. The other thing is, it is extremely important to bring states to the TPNW. And while the vast majority of us campaigners are bringing those states to the TPNW, we can't, we can't neglect the states that are either depending on nuclear sharing or hosting or actually manufacturing nuclear weapons. We don't think that what we're asking the campaigners here to do is too far-fetched, and we also don't think that we have to scale the nuclear armed states. We asked Tarek Rauf to start working with us on a timeline for disarmament. What can be achieved and when? One of the ideas that we're starting to work on is a reduce of 20% every five years. This is a great, non-scary idea where those who have the most will reduce a bit, those who have a little bit will freeze, while they have to commit on no first use, de-alerting, for example, um, not pointing missiles uh, at others, at, 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 at cities. I mean, there are so many things we can do in order to reduce the chance of nuclear war while reminding the world that these weapons are still there and that in every 15 minutes, some crazy person might push the button. I mean, okay, now we don't have Trump, we still have Putin, and we don't know who else is going to get his hands on these weapons. Now, when it comes to the campaign in the Middle East and when it comes to the campaign in Israel, I have to tell you that while we're working on the zone, while we're sitting where we could always wanted to be, I mean, the UN conference on the zone has invited us as observers to sit there and again, remember, these are the Arab states inviting an Iranian and an Israeli and our colleagues, but they know where it comes from to join the room. This is historical. This is amazing. And yet, not just, I mean, not just that we don't have almost any support. We need to bring this. Oh, we got questions. Can you read them out for everybody? Okay, I was just. Uh... But finish your thought. Okay. So when, when we are sitting in the November conference, when we were writing the draft treaties, we remember that we need to write a draft treaty that not only the Arab states and Iran can join, but at one point Israel can, too, can, can join too. We asked the Arab states and Iran to come up with a text to, to actually use the fact that Israel is not in the room in order to move as fast as possible in a room where the, there's a consensus, one state can, of course, veto everything. We asked the Arab states to move as fast as possible, as long as they remember that one day Israel will have to join this treaty, so they need to take it into their mind. At the same time, I can tell you, the campaign in Israel will start when we have more support. I mean, we used to have a one-person campaign in Israel, but I'm too tired to do that. The campaign in Israel is going to be very clear. There is now a safe way to join. We ask you to join. We ask you to sign. We ask you to not ratify until, because if we manage to get Israel into the room, we don't want Israel to just join. We want Israel to put pressure on the rest of the world, on the rest of the eight nuclear states. It has to be a global push. And this is exactly what we came here to ask you to join us with. Let's have a global push for disarmament. And don't forget.
You know what? Let's. Hit. Wow. Now, now you give us all the questions. Okay. This is going to be. Okay. Let's start off with a few. Um, um, given the selective coverage of media in the Middle East, as in many non-Western regions, how do you combat the normalization of violence? How do you show the real cost of nuclear war? Can I give that to you? Well, I don't think that people want to die. I don't think that people want to suffer. But if you look at the fight for um, reducing carbon emissions, for example, I mean, we all see the problem, and yet it's very hard to push forward. When it comes to nuclear weapons, it's the same. Just remind people how scary it is, and they don't want them anymore. I can tell you from experience, I mean, really, working in Israel was not easy. One day we will have time to tell you all the funny stories about that, lots of funny stories there. But when we enter a room in Israel, everybody is hostile. They think I'm the enemy. I'm the one that actually talks about the unspeakable. unspeakable. And I, I am risking Israel just by talking about nuclear weapons. But all I have to do at the beginning is to start with the threat of limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan. And by the end of the hour, all of them want nuclear, global nuclear disarmament. They just want to feel secure by doing that. Now I know, I'm an Israeli. When I say that we want to feel secure, I make most of you angry. But at the end of the day, we're all human, we all want to be secure, we, even Israelis. So if you want a state, and it doesn't matter if it's the US, North Korea, or Pakistan, to disarm, you have to make them feel scared, scared from the fact that they're possessing these weapons, and then give them a safe way to disarm. Great question from Salma. How strong of a threat do you think Saudi Arabia's interest in nuclear weapons is to the goal of disarmament? Now, while there's a lot of focus on Iran's nuclear program, let's just make one thing clear. Iran has yet to develop nuclear weapons. If we want to keep it at that decision not to build a nuclear weapon, we need multilateral diplomacy to work. There is an already an accord. The JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or Iran nuclear deal, that was painstakingly negotiated, really closes the gateway to Iran having a nuclear weapon, both through enrichment track or plutonium. It puts in the most in intrusive inspections regime ever implemented on a sovereign state. So we know that these measures are possible to stop a country like Iran from building nuclear weapons. Now, we know that that deal, after President Trump in 2018 pulled out, has now put it on life support. But the success of the JCPOA Iran nuclear deal also can be fundamentally important for a regional uh, uh, advancement on verification, monitoring, inspections that will be matched by other countries. Saudi Arabia's argument for many years has been that if Iran makes a nuclear weapon, develops a nuclear weapon, they want one too. So the reverse is also true. If Iran doesn't build a nuclear weapon, then hopefully Saudi Arabia will not go that way. However, recent developments in Saudi Arabia, through their facilities that they've built for enrichment, with vast uh, resources being dumped into it, is extremely worrisome. And Saudi Arabia is going on a track that could result in another Middle Eastern country not only making and knowing the knowledge of developing nuclear energy and by virtue possibly diversion to weaponization, but also the history of Saudi Arabia's intimate involvement with the Pakistani nuclear weapons program. And that could be incre increasingly detrimental in terms of any type of non-proliferation uh, advancement in the region. That, the, you highlighted Saudi Arabia, should be on top of our radar while we've been distracted over Iran's nuclear program and Israel's nuclear weapons. Let's go to the next question. We'll do our best well, to... I have to say, I see a few questions here. I, I read English very slowly, I'm sorry. Uh, I see several questions here about uh, even um, how can we talk to... Is uh, the, the very existence of Israel is violence, um, and it's an anonymous. Now, let me be clear. I'm an Israeli, okay? Yeah, Israel is doing some horrible stuff. So does your states. You ask me questions about Israel and the horrible things that Israel is doing, but I'm also Yemen. How many people here are from Britain, right? Your weapons are destroying my other country. So we're all doing horrible things, including Israel. 
Only you are talking about Israel. Now, another thing, because tomorrow there's going to be a thing about racism. Now, when you do care so much about the Palestinians, and when you do care so much about Israel because of the Palestinians, I want, you to, I want to remind you that apart from the Palestinians, there are other 21 Arab states you don't care much about because it's your countries that are doing the harms there. So you only care about the Palestinians because Israel is doing something about them and you haven't helped the Palestinians either. However, those who usually help the Palestinians are Israeli leftists. So in Israel, we are the traitors, and when we come to these places, we are the Israelis. So this is why I'm not going to answer all the questions about Israel and what Israel is doing. I hope I made that point clear. Thank you. So, yes. All right, so, there, there was a, there's a there very... Was also good, some yeah, good sorry. questions here. There was another question which was really interesting that talked about the perception of nuclear armaments in the region and would, like, let's say, in a country like Israel or Iran, be a support for that. Many years ago, there was an interesting poll at the height of the tensions over Iran's nuclear program under Ahmadinejad. And they did, a, they did like, you know, a poll in Israel and also in Iran. And they asked the question, if both countries and across the region did not have nuclear weapons, would you support that or not? And would you rather have Iran and Israel have nuclear weapons? Okay, these are the two questions. Would they both have it or nobody has it? Overwhelming majority of Israelis said that we rather have nobody have it in the region. This is in Israel, huh? And of course in Iran, similar outcome of the poll was also resulted. So we know that when we get to the people and say, here's an option, should everybody have nukes? Or should no one have nukes? I assure you the majority will say, you know what, I don't think I want to have nukes in my neighborhood. Number one. Number two, we have to also make it clear that in a country like Israel, which is small, the size of New Jersey, I mean, I don't know who's from the US, but it's a small country, huh? It's not that big to hide your nuclear weapons and you're surrounded by either failed state, semi-failed state, hostile state, non-state actors. There's a lot of tensions going on. If something goes wrong in Israel, what is the biggest existential threat to Israeli security and existence? It's own nuclear weapons and arsenal. We need to get that, in, that message to the Israeli citizens themselves to know that, wow, wait a minute, hoo-ha. This is not defending me. This is not providing me security. It is the source of the insecurity. Because if Israel does join the region in pushing for a WMD free zone in the Middle East, not only will it be welcomed as part of the region, but it will remove one of the major sticking points for other countries' justifications to advance their nuclear program and to also stigmatize Israel for the long term. So, We've got to see that, and right now, the tensions that's happening, the war with Russia and Ukraine has brought the level of nuclear weapons and the risk of nuclear war to our consciousness, to our global consciousness. We have never been so aware of the threat of nuclear war. Therefore, we should actually capitalize on this. We should take this as an opportunity that, wait a minute, if this thing goes off, we're all doomed. And again, if we give the choice to the citizens, they will overwhelmingly, I am confident, will say, get rid of these nukes, period, in the Middle East and across the world. So if we had a global vote, hmm, I'm sure we can use that as another tool to convince our governments that these archaic weapons are no longer necessary. That rather, instead of using nuclear weapons as a threat, we should see it as holding on to this thing that could be the demise of our own and everybody else. If there is no world left, what is your power worth? What is your money worth? What is your influence worth? So we've got to make that clear. And don't let a few handful of men in a few countries have the option or the choice or the power to hold the rest of us hostage. We need to get that across, that there are nine countries are holding us hostage globally. We got to hold them responsible. And it's about time, the timeline for disarmament globally targets each of these governments from 
build, building coalitions with you if you're in those nuclear weapon states, and we will curate, find solutions that are tangible, that are realistic in your locale, like we did in the Middle East, and we have started it through a regional approach. We've got to get that also in each of these nuclear weapon states. The P5 approach will be different. May that be China, may that be Russia, may that be United States, UK, or France. Like, why does France have nuclear weapons? Bugs me. I mean, what are you, what, who are you going to protect yourself from? From like, uh, I don't know, Spain? Really? Come on. So, that being said, so, we've got to make the discourse change. So there are several more questions here. I won't read them because, honestly, I read very badly. Um, but one of them was about MENA supporting the TPNW and yet not many states. One of the reasons is exactly that. There is a process. The process is being taken. And most of the states in the Middle East, even if they'll sign, they probably won't ratify until there's progress with Israel. And if we want progress with Israel, we need to make a global push. Uh, this is one thing. The second thing was about, uh, I'm just taking several, um, how much do we know about uh, the stories of the Hibakusha? Uh, the Hibakusha and the stories of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were a major part of the campaign in Israel. We have invited Hibakusha to Israel several times and one of the most, I think I, if I talk about it, I'll cry even now, was in Yad Vashem when we had um, a meeting between Hibakusha and the Holocaust survivors for the media. The way that they talked to each other, and remember, Japanese were with Germany then, and the Holocaust survivors and the Hibakusha, they were all at the same age. They knew to ask each other questions that us that never went through these horrors, never able to even think of asking. These two people have seen the devil, they have lived hell, and, and the way that they talked to each other made all the tough journalists, and you know, we have world journalists, they are, to they are tough. Journalists were crying at that room. Um, it's a major impact on the campaign in Israel. And the reason we are talking about a campaign in Israel is because in the Middle East, the vast majority of the states have agreed to the zone, have agreed to disarmament, and, uh, and most of them are not democracies. So a campaign is really crucial in the one state that haven't done it yet. There's another question about deterrence and uh, how it affects, and it, I think the best way to describe it is my first meeting in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where the ambassador there, the first thing he asked me, and it wasn't easy to get to the Israeli Foreign Ministry to begin with, I'm a traitor, and the first thing that he asked me was, are you a traitor? And I was so shocked at the way he asked that of me that I kind of bashed. I was, uh, you know, I have temper too. Um, and I said, no, you are. And he was, what? And I said, I don't know what plans there are in your, in your, under your desk, but you can't, you can't keep nuclear arms race from the Middle East. We are reaching a crossroad. We are reaching a crossroad, and we still are moving towards this crossroad, and if the November conference talks will fail, we'll get there. And this, this is where we're going at. Saudi Arabia, a friend of the US now, can have nuclear weapons if they just desire, very easily, quite easily. The UAE, Jordan, and Egypt all have nuclear facilities. Jordan has uranium. All of these states can start a nuclear arm race, or can start, can start nuclear arms race if they'll feel the need, and they do have the excuses to do so, and some of them are expressing already the excuses to do so, either because of Israel or because of the threat from Iran. So all the, there are at least four states in the Middle East that are able of and thinking of maybe one day getting nuclear weapons. None of them we can bomb, because they're all friends with the US. So I said, what are your plans? I don't know. I know what our plans are. And I have to say that this person at the foreign ministry, after this bashing, because I was so insulted, I just said it like, hmm. He said, I think we need to meet and talk more. more, more. So, so even in Israel, even the hardliners, when you talk to them about possibilities, they can be with us. 
the one thing that is needed is an international campaign. There was a, there was a question which is, I think, important anyway, just to mention, and that's the role of religion. Now, like it or not, religion plays an important part in the Middle East. Um, we can't avoid it. This is the reality. And in every single Abrahamic religion which dominates the Middle East, where 98% of the population is Muslim, Shia or Sunni, doesn't matter, but they're Muslim, and the other 2% are Christian and Jews, those religions are based on peace. Am I right? When we greet each other, we say salam in Farsi, salamu alaykum in Arabic, shalom in Hebrew. They're all based on peace. Now, those Abrahamic religions also have followers all around the world. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of people maybe here or in the Western world also follow prophets that came about in this region. So we are all somehow connected to this. The power of religion is useful to advance disarmament. When the Pope Francis made a declaration against nuclear weapons, that's powerful. We can actually use that. When even Ayatollah Khamenei, for whatever you know, um, reservations you may have, the fatwa, the religious decree that forbids Iran possessing, using, and stockpiling nuclear weapons, also is used internally as a way to stop Iran from advancing towards a nuclear weapon. And I'm hoping that within the Jewish faith, there will be many rabbis uh, that will be also coming forward in uh, advancing the call for disarmament. And the fact that nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction are indiscriminate, and their indiscriminate use or impact is against every religion, every basis of what seeks peace and forgiveness and so forth. So yes, religion, religion can be a powerful tool in the Middle East, and I think that's one that we should explore more. And finally, there was a, there was a question about like, you know, this, this idea of a Middle East union, huh? this vision of the future. And I, if you give me a minute, I, I want you to really imagine this region. It's vast, 24 countries. The geographical area that the Middle East zone eventually will have will be one and a half times the size of the United States. It will have half a billion inhabitants. Its GDP, its economy, will be the fourth largest as a collective around the world. It will still be strategic for energy, for, uh, for a demographic that is young and able to really be at the forefront of advancement and prosperity in the region. So when we are imagining this union, it has to start somewhere, am I right? And guess what? Guess what? The European Union didn't start off with a hoo-ha. It started with economic cooperation. Steel and coal was the case. Well, in the Middle East, it can be oil and gas. It was about how do we separate the nuclear fuel so that the Germans don't have nuclear weapons, and that gave us Eurodif. Well, in the Middle East, there's a possibility for a regional enrichment facility, possibly as a way to stop um, one nation having enrichment capabilities. So on the nuclear front, this can be a basis. It's about, again, funny enough, at the base of it, religion. It was a basically a peace treaty between the Protestants, the Catholics, and the Anglicans, and later on, the Orthodox. So even religion played an important role. That's why Turkey is going to be knocking on European Union door and ain't going to get in. And finally, it's about actually realizing the value of peace, because that's the biggest, biggest prize of the European Union, that since its inception, it has stopped the carnage between European countries. So it is a valuable lesson for a region like Middle East that, yes, we can put our differences aside and fight it over, I don't know, this music festival thing that you have, a Eurovision, yeah, or like football or something, fight over it like that. We can do the same in the Middle East. And finally, to think about the fact that like, the value and principles of the people in that region are the same as everybody else. They also want security. They also want a future that they can look forward to. We need to inject hope into the people and a vision that is different to the one that is being sown every day when they look at the reality around them. So for that, we need to give an alternative and then provide these practical steps. We are done in, we're doing it over the WMD zone. 
but there's many areas we want to venture into. And that's why the remapping project that I mentioned does touch into human security, environment, you know, political, social, gender rights, and all across these issues that are necessary to make progress on so that we can actually see that vision, not in a hundred years, but to actually realize that it's so close. It's actually here if we wake up. And we need the support of the global community primarily because those same five nuclear weapon states are the largest providers of the means of war in the Middle East. When the United States is the largest export of weapons and half of those weapons goes into the Middle East, where do you think it ends up? In the heads and hearts of the youth and elsewhere in the region. So the carnage has a source, has a mean. We've got to eradicate those means. We've got to put pressure on our governments to stop selling these weapons, conventional or otherwise, that has bled for so many decades the Middle East. So that's powerful for us to invest. All right, I'm back. If I think we have time for one more. Yeah? yeah? So there's a question here, what do you do with the media? And what do you do with when the media refuses to cover? Uh, now, I'm going to talk about Israel, but I've seen your media. It's not much better, okay? So even when there's no secrecy, they don't know how to talk about these things. In Israel, for example, when Netanyahu was the prime minister and probably will be the prime minister soon, again, sadly, um, the media criticized and checked, fact-checked him on everything he said, but not on nuclear, not on Iran. Whatever he said about Iran, it was cut and paste. Everything else, they took it for granted. Now, in this case, we have two major things. One is social media, where we control the message. And the second thing is, and that's extremely important, we need, we need, I mean, I know, we got a Nobel Peace Prize. It was great, lots of interviews in Israel because of that. However, on the day-to-day -day basis, they don't care. Most people don't care about nuclear weapons, and it was up to us to make them think about it and to do it in a way that will make them invite us to the, to, to the studios to talk, and when you talk to, in the radio, I mean, I, I can tell you that I even got interviewed, like I get interviewed every six months on IDF radio, which is interesting because it's, an important because it's one of the only national radio stations, okay? The, re, the way that we got to the main media was not easy, but it went through uh, non-violent direct actions, demonstrations, the first time, I mean, after a year, almost, almost seven years, uh, seven months of trying to get something into the media, the way that we got into the media was by our first real action, and that was when we went to a nuclear uh, conference on Iran, of course. President Perez then, the father of the Israeli nuclear program, was speaking there. We knew that the media will be there. You go where the media is, and then you make something that they cannot ignore. In the case of President Perez, we knew that the cameras will be on him. If the cameras will be on him, we need to be with our burners next to him. How do you run towards a president without looking threatening, without looking violence, and without violent and without getting shot at the process? The answer was getting naked. If you're naked, you're not threatening. And if you add to that, some banners saying stripping the Middle East of weapons of mass destruction, then you get on the news. This is an NVDA, something that us campaigners need to go back to big time. Thank you, gang. <laughs> All right, I think we are being, uh, I think our time is slowly coming to an end. Everybody, if you can, Follow this is a website. On, follow us on our social media. The tag, the whatever. Ha, hashtag? The hashtag is WMD Free Me. WMD Free Me. Okay? M E, Middle East. Twitter, 
Facebook, all of those goodies. Most TikTok. of our work is oh, on Zoom. Oh, we're even on TikTok now. We're on TikTok. Yeah. Uh, Instagram. So follow us, number one. If you have time, volunteer. If you got money, donate. If you have somebody wealthy in the family, send them our way. Because we do need resources. We need all the resources we need. And we have to be, stop being shy about saying that, damn it, there are billions going into the means of war and very little to the means of peace. We've got to flip that around. So let's do that. Let's find our way, whatever it is. If you're an expert in WMD disarmament or security, you're a topical expert or regional expert, reach out to us. If you just want to get involved and do something, we are here. If you want to do activism, look at her. Sharoni has been arrested, I don't know, countless times for her activism, and she's still hanging in there, and she in the does police. it in Israel, okay? No. Now, seriously, everything we've done, including our draft treaties, everything that we've done, we've done with no funds whatsoever. Imagine what we can do if we have a bit. But with no funds, you can join us on Zoom, Come and think with us on, on mechanisms to get your nuclear states joining any kind of talks to reduce the tension of wars, to reduce the numbers, and to join whatever talks we can offer them to stop nuclear weapons. And don't forget, Thank you. if we all chip a little bit at this mountain, you never know when it starts to crumble. So keep chipping in the best way you know, and the best way could be in every form that I just mentioned. So don't give up. We can dismantle this. We can get rid of nuclear weapons. And if anybody says to you otherwise, they're full of okay? So keep on, keep on.
Okay, I think we'll start. Thank you for coming um, to, uh, to this uh, session on content from the nuclear weapons ban monitor. You can um, take a look in the copies. Uh, this, um, uh, this is a, a reference work. You're not supposed to read it uh, you know, from page one to, 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 to the end. There are separate sections for each country and then for each prohibition and each, uh, and each um, positive obligation. So, but there is a wealth of information in there. There we go. The Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor is produced by Norwegian People's Aid, the organization that I work for, which is a member of uh, ICANN. Uh, our donors are Austria, Ireland, New Zealand, and Plowshares Fund. And we uh, produce this uh, with contributions from a broad uh, uh, range of external uh, experts on nuclear disarmament issues, on legal issues, verification issues, etc. And we cover all of the 197 states that can sign treaties that the UN Secretary General is depository for. So that's the 193 UN member states, and it's the two observers, uh, the Holy See and Palestine, and then two more additional states uh, that are allowed to sign multilateral treaties, and that's Nua and Cook Islands. And uh, there are state profiles then in, uh, in the report for each of those states. On the website, there is also a report back function on each, uh, uh, each uh, state profile. We used the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as the primary yardstick for tracking progress towards a world without nuclear weapons. Because that treaty contains all the, all the measures uh, uh, that are needed to take in order to achieve a world without nuclear weapons and to keep a world without nuclear weapons. And we uh, then measure, uh, we look at all of these 197 states and we measure whether uh, their policies and practices are compliant or compatible with each of the prohibitions and each of the positive obligations of the treaty. So compliance is then for the states that have signed and ratified or signed the treaty. And then we look at the compatibility also of all other states, even if they have not signed or are even uh, opposed to signing the treaty. And the reason why we do that is to give guidance to states that are considering signing the treaty or that may uh, consider to do so in the, uh, sometime in the future and for civil society parliamentarians that are trying uh, to, to influence in their states. And then we have uh, legal interpretations uh, of each of the prohibitions and positive obligations and they are the legal interpretations uh, um, are included here and made by um, uh, legal experts uh, on uh, international law, international disarmament law, based on uh, their deep knowledge of other uh, long-standing uh, treaties uh, on disarmament where the same wordings are contained, the same prohibitions are contained in other treaties. So we know a lot and there are established understandings of how, what the words in each prohibition uh, means. Uh, and, and that's contained in here. And then we also track the status of all of these 197 states in relation to the NPT, in relation to nuclear weapon free zone treaties, the comprehensive test ban treaty, the uh, partial test ban treaty, and also chemical weapons convention, biological weapons convention, and the Conference on Disarmament, and also the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreements and additional protocols with the IAEA. So if you take a look at the state profile for your country, you can see that there is a wealth of information there on, uh, on the status of that country uh, in relation to all of these treaties that are uh, important uh, for progress towards the world nuclear weapons and on their compliance and compatibility, how they are doing in, in relation to uh, signing of the treaty. 
if we take a look at the big picture of the prohibitions of the TPNW that are, we are going to focus on today, there are uh, several other sessions here this week that uh, this weekend that are focusing on the positive obligations, but we are going to look at the prohibitions. You will see then uh, that of these 197 states, that are, there are 89 that are states' parties or signatories that haven't yet ratified, but will do so very shortly, I'm sure. And they are all compliant with all of the prohibitions uh, of the treaty. And then we have an additional 64 states that are not party yet to the treaty, but that have policies and practices that are fully compatible with all of the prohibitions of the treaty. And that means if you find here uh, that uh, the state you are looking at, that they, they are compatible on all of the prohibitions, it means that they don't have to make any changes in order to, uh, to, to be compliant with the treaty if they, if they sign and, uh, and ratify. Then there are two states that uh, are not party that have policies and practices that are of concern. Uh, this is looking at 2021, uh, and we'll come back to that. And then finally, uh, the 42 states that are not party that have policies and practices that are not compatible with one or more of the prohibitions of the treaty. So those states uh, need to do uh, uh, varying degrees of changes if they want to be in compliance with all of the uh, prohibitions uh, of the treaty. And those 42 states are the nine nuclear armed states and uh, the 32 uh, uh, umbrella states and one more state, the Marshall Islands, that we'll come back to. If you very quickly look at the compliance and compatibility then of all states by region, uh, you can see that Europe is the main issue. That is where we have the main challenge in relation to being, uh, to following, being in line with the prohibitions that are set out in this treaty. And the all of the prohibitions are contained in Article 1.1 of the treaty, and that's the, uh, very much the heart of the treaty. And these are the prohibitions. We've broken down then the compliance and compatibility by all of the uh, prohibitions, but we're going to go through them uh, one by one. I was told that uh, our, one of our legal experts, Stuart Maslin, would be available. Is he? He is. Hi, everyone. Okay, but can we can't can we see him? We were also told that we would be able to see him. Yeah, there he is. Don't, don't adjust your set. I actually do look like this. Okay, so, so they'll have to switch you in when you speak. Then, very That's impressive fine. library there, Stuart. He's um, he's in uh, South Africa uh, right now, where he's uh, he's teaching. So you can bring back the slides then. Okay, so what we want to do here is to go through each prohibition and how they are inter interpreted and looking at in 2021, which is mostly the same situation today, uh, looking at the world, which states are in compliance and compatible, or have policies that are compatible uh, with the treaty and which do not. And then I would very much like for you to ask questions then after each prohibition. If you have questions about, what about this? Isn't this, uh, isn't this covered by this treaty? Why is it not? So because we always get all of these questions. So Stuart is um, available as one of our, uh, our very knowledgeable legal experts to, to help answer those questions. We are going to start with the prohibition on development production, manufacturing, and acquisition of nuclear weapons. And clearly, the nine nuclear armed states, China, France, India, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, United Kingdom, and the United States have policies and practices that are not compatible with that prohibition. Uh, and then there are two states, Iran and Saudi Arabia, that have policies and practices that are of concern that we have to all pay attention to, as you know. But then otherwise, among uh, all of the 
states partisan signatories, D89. The uh, they are all compliant, of course, and also the majority of all of those that are not states parties or signatories, the 97. Looking at the interpretation, what does, the, what does this mean? The word development, that means all actions and activities intended to prepare for the production uh, of nuclear weapons, including the research, including the computer modeling, testing of key components, and also subcritical testing, meaning that testing that where you don't get an uncontrolled nuclear uh, chain reaction. That is also included in this prohibition. And then production and manufacturing, those two words, it's good to know that they are largely overlapping concepts that cover the processes that are about actually uh, producing or manufacturing the completed usable weapon. And production is a bit wider than manufacturing because it also covers uh, improvised uh, methods to make a nuclear weapon or adaptation of a nuclear explosive device. And then finally, there's this wording that says in the treaty or otherwise acquiring nuclear weapons, which is a catch-all provision that encompasses any means of obtaining nuclear weapons other than through producing uh, and manufacturing it including importing it, leasing it, borrowing it, recovering it, uh, if, if you find one, in a, <laughs> or if you capture or steal one. All of that is, uh, uh, doing any of that is, uh, is a, a violation of the prohibition uh, in 11A of development, production, manufacturing, and acquisition, if you are a state party. Also, important to know then that this prohibition also covers key components, not just the, the full assembled nuclear weapon, but also key components. And it is also very important to know that it's widely accepted, although it doesn't say anywhere in the treaty, but it is widely accepted that the missile uh, and the rocket or other munition are key components, even if the nuclear warhead is not included in the missile, the missile itself uh, <clears throat> is a key component of the nuclear weapon. So that means that any time that you read about uh, a state testing uh, nuclear capable missiles, that is development of nuclear weapons. And um, we also then get questions about what about uh, the delivery platforms? What about the aircraft or the submarine? But they are not uh, considered to be key components of nuclear weapons as such, and are not then by our legal uh, experts considered to be captured by the prohibitions in Article 1, even though they may, of course, be very integral to a nuclear weapon system. And then there are dual use components uh, that can be used both for nuclear weapons and also for non-nuclear weapons, and they will only be captured and prohibited development of that or manufacturing if the intention is to use them in nuclear weapons. Do we have any questions on this prohibition? It is pretty straightforward. No questions on this one. Then we'll... To ask a question, go to slido.com. Oh, yeah, I have to... Look here. Yeah, we're getting to that question later. Um, this is then the prohibition on possession and stockpiling. Again, the, it's the nine nuclear armed states that, uh, uh, that we know that have practices and conduct that is, uh, is not compatible with this treaty uh, in relation to, to this prohibition. And if you need a reminder of why they are not compatible uh, with the, the, the prohibition. These are the numbers. 5,977 nuclear uh, warheads in Russia at the beginning of this year, 5,428 in the United States, 350 in China, France 290, UK 225, Pakistan 165, 
India 160, Israel 90, and North Korea 20. And we're very happy to have the Federation of American Scientists contributing directly to the Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor with their uh, latest knowledge uh, on the world's nuclear arsenals. Uh, in terms of the interpretation, what this prohibition means is that it, it makes it illegal to have a nuclear weapon in any way. It doesn't mean that you have to own it, just be in possession of it somehow. And one nuclear weapon means that you also are stockpiling. So it's pretty straightforward. I assume there are no important questions on that one. The prohibition on testing, as you can see in 2021, all states, all the 197 states, were compatible with this prohibition, which is good, because uh, nuclear weapons have not been tested since North Korea last tested a weapon in 2017. But as we know, um, there are a lot of in the news now that they believe that nuclear that North Korea again will test uh, uh, a nuclear weapon uh, soon, and then it's important that we use this treaty and apply it and say that this is, this is prohibited under, under this treaty and not uh, accepted. Good to know on the prohibition on testing is uh, that it, it's limited to explosive testing. Remember that we spoke about the prohibition on development, that the non-explosive forms of testing, they are outlawed by that prohibition on development. So, Test, the prohibition on testing in this treaty is just about explosive testing. And as you also know, all explosive testing also contravenes the, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, even though that treaty isn't, um, isn't yet in, in, in force, and also arguably customary international law. Moving on to the prohibition on transfer. One state in uh, 2021 had uh, a conduct that uh, contravened this uh, prohibition of the treaty because uh, they uh, leased missiles and uh, transfer or basically uh, export key components to the UK for their nuclear weapons. To transfer means to transmit possession or ownership and it, again, it also covers the key components. If, if you do, to, to, to do that in separate you know, installments, you don't, it doesn't have to be a complete nuclear weapons. It can be uh, several tra uh, transfers of uh, key components, and also if it goes via intermediaries or third parties. And it, this is the case, even if you don't pay for it or in any, in any other with any other form of consideration. Just raise your hand if you have any question on any of these. And then that's the mirror of that prohibition on, uh, on transfer is that there is also a prohibition then on receiving the transfer or control. And in 2021, there was one state, the United Kingdom, that ha had conduct that uh, was not compatible with this prohibition because they imported uh, key components for, from the United States and leased missiles. And uh, yeah, this is again to receive uh, a transfer uh, is to take possession of a key component or a nuclear weapon, or, uh, and it doesn't require ownership. And again, it's both key components and uh, an assembled weapon. We have a question. How can I take a question from the audience? Technically, I don't. Just. Uh, Stuart, did you hear this question? Can we switch in, Stuart? I, I couldn't hear, I'm afraid. Could you repeat the question, uh, Greta? Uh, I was wondering if there's a military base, that's a US military base in the UK. Yeah, I, I think he needs a microphone. Can you give a microphone to the audience, please? 
Is that possible? But, I, but he's, he's asking about uh, US, uh, a US base on UK territory uh, where there is uh, media discussion now on uh, no, please give it to him. It's fine. Yeah, he'll he'll do it. Yes. Um, so in in the UK, there's a there's a military base called Lake and Heath. Um, believe it, I'm not sure, but I believe it's classed as US territory. So they're bringing back nuclear weapons, their airdrop. They were trying to do it in secret as well. But I was wondering if this would violate the the transfer if the base is classed as a US base in the UK. Um, thank you for the question. Well, that's very uh, troubling news. Um, I would be surprised if it was considered to be US sovereign territory. Um, that very rarely occurs. What does happen is that jurisdiction over criminal matters uh, is retained under a status of forces agreement. Um, but uh, on that basis, I think uh, that yes, because that is coming onto UK territory, uh, it would obviously be an issue of um, install, uh, installing, deploying uh, nuclear weapons on UK territory, if, if, if that's true. Um, whether it would be a transfer, I, I'd need to see the detail of, of what's going on. Um, but uh, thank you for raising the issue. We will definitely look into that. And if you're provide, able to provide us with information, I realise you explained it was secret, but if, if there's any information that you've got that you can share with us, we will definitely look into that and do a bit more detailed analysis. Good, yeah, thank you. And that's exactly the kind of uh, contact that we would like to have, you know, to, for people to contact us uh, via the websi website in general or on the state profile for that country to bring up issues that are about how to apply this to your countries. The prohibition on use, again, it's all green. Fortunately, there has been no use uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, since uh, 1945. The prohibition on use. I think it's interesting to look a little bit at the interpretation there. To use a nuclear weapon means to launch, release, deliver, or detonate a nuclear weapon with hostile intent or for so-called peaceful use, uh, such as in civil engineering. Uh, there's not much of that going on, but in, in, in the past, there, this has been the case. But, and it's important to know that also use for uh, so-called peaceful uh, use uh, is also covered by this prohibition. Uh, the possession or deployment of nuclear weapons for the purpose of nuclear deterrence does not amount to use under the TPNW. I, we know that um, this is a, a frequent argument, and it, it's still a correct argument, because uh, the possession of nuclear weapons is a form of violence, absolutely. Uh, but in order uh, to be captured by this treaty's prohibition on use, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the deterrence is not uh, captured here. But it is captured under the prohibition on possession that we, uh, we spoke about earlier. And then the prohibition on threatening to use. Also in 2021, we didn't find any clear cases uh, of a state having threatened to use nuclear weapons. There were a couple of uh, cases that, where you could discuss whether uh, it, it, it amounted to a threat to use or not. Uh, for instance, um, where this picture is from, which is from uh, Operation uh, Global Thunder, where the U.S. Uh, did a military um, or a nuclear strike exercise. That in that situation, uh, because of uh, uh, because of the um, the tense situation, uh, the way it was done uh, could potentially be perceived as a threat to use under this treaty. But there was no conclusion by the lawyers that that it was. But for 2021, as you know. Uh, clearly, uh, Russia, uh, when, uh, no, 2022, when we make that report, clearly Russia uh, will be on this list as having threatened to use nuclear weapons in 2022. Uh, uh, the th prohibition on threatening to use is uh, interesting uh, because this is where a lot of the context-related um, uh, 
uh, issues uh, uh, that we have to keep in mind when we want to speak about whether a state is doing something that is not uh, compatible with this treaty or not. In order to say that something is a threat of use under this treaty, uh, what, uh, what the, the expression, uh, the, what is being done or said has to be credible in the circumstances, meaning that it has to be said by a person or authority that are actually in a position to affect or direct the use of nuclear weapons. If it's at a very low level of government, for instance, it, even if they say we want to nuke Europe, uh, it, it can't be considered a threat under this treaty. Also. Uh, it has to be specific as to what kind of use uh, and the target of possible use, but it doesn't have to be explicit. It can be also implicit. And uh, the threats that we have seen from uh, uh, Putin uh, are of the implicit kind. It doesn't say it outright, but there are actions and wordings that uh, amount to implicit threats to use nuclear weapons as prohibited under the TPNW and uh, under no other treaty. I think that's also very important. This is the treaty that doesn't accept those kinds of acts. Um, missile testing or explosive tests of a nuclear weapon or nuclear strike exercises, when that in, happens in uh, circumstances of te tension, it might amount uh, to threat to use. We already discussed the picture in this uh, Operation uh, Global, uh, Global Thunder. Uh, for Russia in 2022, they've done uh, missile testing and exercises that amount to threat uh, to use. And again, then, but the broader concept of nuclear deterrence, where the threat to use nuclear weapons is general and not specific in nature, is, in the view of our legal experts, not sufficient in itself to constitute a threat to use under the TPNW. But that doesn't mean that, 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 that nuclear deterrence is, uh, is legal in any way, because deterrence practices are illegal under the prohibition on possession and stockpiling. Are there any questions on that for Stuart? No. Then the prohibition on seeking or receiving assistance. You can see that I, I uh, skipped over uh, 11E. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that for, uh, for last. Uh, the prohibition on seeking or receiving assistance. There were five countries in 2021 that uh, had uh, policies, practices that were not compatible with this prohibition. And most importantly, uh, Belarus. You probably saw in, uh, in the news reports that uh, President Lukashenko, he, he uh, clearly uh, encouraged, asked Russia to deploy nuclear weapons uh, in uh, Belarus. And uh, that was uh, not compatible with this uh, prohibition. Uh, because this prohibition prevents states from seeking or receiving assistance to violate the TPNW themselves in to getting help to do something that is not legal. And uh, so that means that it precludes them from asking any other state or any legal or natural person to help them develop nuclear weapons, possess nuclear weapons, stockpile nuclear weapons, test, produce, use, transfer, or receive nuclear weapons or to allow uh, nuclear weapons on their territory. And it doesn't matter if the, you actually receive the assistance, it's enough that you you are asking for it and seeking it. And then the prohibition on allowing stationing, installation or deployment. There are five countries only that, uh, that have uh, conduct that is not compatible with this prohibition. Belgium, Germany, Italy, Netherlands and Turkey. And uh, just a reminder to everyone, I'm sure you are well aware of this, these are the basis and the amount, uh, the numbers of nuclear weapons that are then deployed on their territory. Uh, interpretation, that this, <clears throat> this prohibition applies to the hosting of foreign nuclear weapons on the state's party's territory. So the fact that, for instance, 
the UK deploys nuclear weapons in uh, Scotland is, is not, uh, th 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 that's not a problem under this uh, prohibition. But that's a part of possession uh, and stockpiling is where that is covered. It applies at all times, uh, this prohibition, including during escalating tension or armed conflict, which is important because there are some, um, for instance, NATO states like my own country, Norway, that have a prohibition, or not a prohibition, but a policy that prohibits nuclear weapons on Norwegian territory in times of peace. But it doesn't say anything about times of uh, escalating tension, which is right now, for instance. So there's nothing in Norwegian policy that prevents deployment of nuclear weapons on Norwegian territory uh, today. But the, this treaty, uh, uh, if Norway were a party to this treaty, it would be prohibited. And deployment of these words, stationing, installation, or deployment, deployment is the broadest uh, wording. And uh, that means that to violate the prohibition on deployment, you don't, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, an act that lasts for a very long time at all. And there hasn't, doesn't have to be a, an agreement around it or an infrastructure. So as some of you uh, probably have noted, transit is not prohibited under this treaty. But this, uh, this prohibition uh, amends uh, amends that, because if movement into the territory of a state party with nuclear weapons is not followed very swiftly by exit, then this might amount to a violation of this treaty. And you can say that, well, this is deployment. Even if the plan is, they say, well, it's on their way out, then we can start. And th this is something that we could see happening now, soon, with the, the way the world is now. So if this happens, then this is the prohibition that we need to look to, to discuss it. And then the prohibition on assistance, encouragement, and inducement, which is the prohibition that is um, uh, the, the, that where the most countries have a conduct that is not compatible. And most of these countries are European countries. And you see the list, I'm sure. This prohibition is then also the one that is most discussed. I, I know that there are opponents of the TPNW that say that it's impossible to know what uh, assistance means. You never know uh, if you're signing up to this treaty, you will never know what it is that you can do and, and can't do. And this is not the case. But because as we mentioned earlier, uh, um, like for the other uh, prohibitions, the wordings, assistance, encouragement, and inducement are, uh, are prohibitions that um, uh, exist also in other long-standing uh, disarmament treaties and where there are established understanding among uh, a legal experts of what it means. Uh, and it's also important to know that it's not important to identify whether an act is assistance or, or encouragement or inducement. The main thing is, is it in compliance or compatible with this Article 11E or not? If you can clearly say that this, yes, this is assistance, then you don't also have to find out whether it's encouragement. In some cases, you can not say that it's assistance, but you can say that it's encouragement. So what, what does the state have to do in, uh, what, in order to, to do something that constitutes assistance? First of all, you have to remember when you look at then your country that there has to be a causal link between what that state is doing and what a nuclear armed state is then doing that is prohibited. And what uh, the, the state does has to be a significant contribution. It doesn't have to be essential, but it has to be uh, significant. And the prohibited activity has to be something that is ongoing or that will happen, you know, that can happen quite soon, temporally proximate. So it doesn't have to have happened or be ongoing, but it can't be something that is just a theoretical possibility. 
Uh, for instance, uh, I might argue that uh, Norway is assisting the United States in using nuclear weapons. And yes, in many ways you can say that, but sort of legally, that won't be the case uh, until we get to a situation where, clearly, where Norway participates in a more concrete situation where we are actually talking about use and not just about the opportunity, the possibility of use. And also the state has to do this with knowledge that they are assisting a prohibited activity. So if uh, a something is discussed that is a, a temporally remote or an incidental contribution, then it's not covered. And then we have a question. Can you, can you go to the microphone so that Stuart can hear you? You can switch in, my, uh, switch in Stuart, please. Yeah, I'm Wolfgang Nick from Germany. Uh, what is assistance? For example, we know what are the planes where the US nuclear weapons are transported. It's a very specific airplane. When you know these are landing, uh, but the state says, I don't know what is in the thing, and we don't try to find out. The same thing is also the case with that big NATO airport in Ireland. Most of the long-range flights from US uh, make a short stop there before they go to Germany mm. or somewhere else. Uh, another thing, assistance. NATO has a forum, uh, the nuclear planning group. The countries are sitting there this is a good strategy, this is not. We don't know what they are talking. Isn't the nuclear planning group assisting the possible application of nuclear weapons, for example, in Germany or in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Stuart, did you get those questions? Yes, thank you. So we do address the nuclear planning group uh, in the report in, in a little bit of uh, detail. And clearly, uh, a state that is party to the TPNW cannot participate in that uh, uh, planning group. You're talking about um, either assistance or uh, encouraging, uh, both of which, are, of course, are prohibited under this uh, provision. The, the first question you ask is, is a little more difficult. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you seem to be questioning Ireland's commitment to the treaty, suggesting that they're turning a blind eye to uh, the US bringing nuclear weapons into uh, Ireland and then onwards. I would be very surprised if, if that's the case. Of course, I can't rule it out, but I think Ireland's commitment to this treaty has been uh, utterly consistent and, uh, and very determined. So uh, I, I think we need to be careful when we suggest that a particular state is deliberately turning a blind eye uh, to something. I'm not saying that the US wouldn't do stuff on the quiet, but then I don't think you can hold under international law, you can hold a state responsible for something that they're simply not aware of. And I equally don't think it's re realistic uh, because we did have this discussion, as you probably remember, during the negotiations themselves about how are you going to check every single uh, vessel, every single aircraft that comes through your territory to see whether they've got nuclear weapons on board. It's just not realistically going to happen. So I think what we did in the negotiations is to come up with a realistic compromise. As Greta rightly said, if uh, nuclear weapons are coming onto the territory and the state knows about that, uh, then we've got a very different kettle of fish. But I don't think we can proactively require every state party to verify cargo on every military uh, uh, aircraft or um, uh, warship uh, is just not possible, I don't believe. But I, I accept that there may be different views out there. Okay, next slide on this, on encouragement. To encourage um, uh, a state to do an act that is prohibited by the treaty it means to persuade it or seek to persuade it uh, to, to carry out that prohibited activity or to continue to do so. Uh, the activity uh, that is prohibited uh, doesn't have to materialize. It is the act of encouragement that is prohibited here and not the actual result. The result is prohibited elsewhere in all of the other prohibitions that we've discussed. And encouragement can take the form of verbal, written, material or institutional support. 
And then inducement, uh, which uh, I don't know if Stuart will be happy that I'll say this, but uh, what I'm basically trying to say is that you can really forget about it because if it's inducement, it will, there will also be encouragement. So basically we are talking just about assistance and encouragement. All acts uh, that are um, problematic and will be either one of those. So, most importantly, when we are discussing uh, assistance um, and encouragement and that prohibition of this treaty and states that are wondering, can we join this treaty uh, or not? It is important to state that it is clear that the, the states parties to the TPNW can remain in alliances and military cooperation arrangements with nuclear armed states and they can continue to execute all operations, exercises, and other military activities together with them insofar as they do not involve nuclear weapons. But all of the nuclear arm, the, 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 uh, the states that are under a nuclear umbrella, they have to make some changes in order, uh, there are some changes that they need to, 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 to do in order to, to meet the requirements of this treaty. Because today, uh, they are doing uh, all of these activities that are covered with the separate sections uh, in the treaty. And as I already mentioned, there's the, is it significant? Uh, what is the context? Is there knowledge, etc.? The context matters, so we can't say that all kinds of activities that uh, are in this range are prohibited. It, it depends. You have to look at it. Um, uh, but these are activities that are then frequently take place in umbrella states and that uh, may and often do contravene uh, Article 1.1e and the prohibition on assistance and encouragement. First of all, it's um, participation in nuclear strike exercises. Uh, for instance, um, uh, if um, a state participates with, uh, with conventional aircraft in a nuclear, uh, nuclear strike exercise, uh, giving protection uh, to, uh, to, the, um, to the actual bomber plane, for instance, or flying in front of it and uh, escorting it, etc. Uh, that is most often uh, assistance uh, to uh, uh, or encouragement to possession of nuclear weapons. If it is a nuclear strike exercise that would constitute a threat of use, then it is assistance to threat of use. This can also be the case for uh, joint maneuvers where they are just you know, flying together, but it isn't clear that it's, it's a nuclear strike exercise. And this brings us to the point that you raised that, um, for instance, all of the strategic bombers, they are dual capable. We don't know at any time whether they are practicing uh, the use of nuclear weapons or whether they are practicing the, con the use of conventional weapons. And it's only when there is clear evidence that we are talking about a, a, a nuclear-related uh, joint maneuver that we can start looking at saying that this, this, is, uh, this is contravening this prohibition. The, the starting point for, um, uh, for dual-capable uh, delivery platforms is that it is fine unless we, there is evidence that, it is, that we're talking about nuclear, uh, nuclear issues. And then, uh, again, the same issue then for logistical and technical support. If a state gives uh, logistical um, support, for instance, to a, uh, um, a nuclear-armed submarine, yes, that is assistance uh, to possession. But if it is uh, logistic support to a strategic bomber that can both deliver conventional weapons and, uh, and nuclear weapons, then we have to assume that we are, that, that the, the, the support is given to the conventional part, uh, unless we can clearly identify that they are on a nuclear mission. So there, you need to identify and, and look at the, the context. And the problem is, of course, that most often we don't get access to that kind of information. But uh, very often we can say that there is uh, 
at least uh, a nuclear shadow is cast on the countries that uh, participate in joint maneuvers or uh, provide uh, support in those cases where we are talking about uh, dual use. And uh, participation in nuclear planning, uh, of course, and the nuclear planning group, uh, clearly. Uh, allowing the testing of nuclear capable missiles on your territory is also not um, allowed by, uh, by this um, prohibition. That's the, then the case for Marshall Islands, unfortunately, where, they, the, where the, the US leases territory where uh, testing of nuclear capable missiles takes place. And then most importantly, endorsement of nuclear weapons doctrines, policies and statements and most importantly, NATO's strategic concept. That is where most of the states, the 36 states that we say are not compatible with this prohibition, that is the main thing that they need to change. They need to withdraw and their, their support for the nuclear-related components in, do, in the, the doctrines and the strategic concepts. They need to say that, no, we do not agree. Uh, uh, in, in the use of nuclear weapons. We will not support the use of nuclear weapons or uh, the possession. And then, uh, of course, if, you, if a company on your uh, territory develops, produces, maintains key components for nuclear weapons, then you, you as a state, because you allow that, then you are also assisting uh, the, uh, the development, production and maintenance. And financing of prohibited activities um, is, uh, can also constitute assistance to use nuclear weapons, no, to, uh, to, for instance, develop or produce nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, you may have noticed that finance is not explicitly prohibited uh, by this treaty, but then there is this prohibition uh, on assistance, because directly financing, providing a loan, or a credit line to a company that develops uh, to develop nuclear weapons, that is uh, uh, sufficient to, uh, to fall foul of, of this prohibition. And then there is intelligence gathering and sharing, uh, of course, also, um, where it all depends. And then we just want to change, uh, leave on this, that it doesn't, it's not most important whether a state is uh, red uh, or green here in this treaty. It's about identifying what does my state need to change in order to, to be able to follow uh, the high standard uh, that is set by this treaty. And in some cases, it may not be possible to conclude. It might be a little bit uh, unclear, particularly to say that it's not okay today even though we know that it may be so in the future, because we know that all of this is about possible use uh, in the future. And then the central issue is whether maintaining that particular practice or capability would run counter to the object and purpose of the treaty, which is to ensure that nuclear weapons are never again used. And Article 5 of the treaty also obligates each state party to take all appropriate um, measures to prevent and suppress. So that means that um, the uh, issues uh, that are problematic, there's great, sort of a good legal basis for a state to take action on those. But for most of these case states, uh, there's not a lot that needs to be changed. And it is absolutely possible. Do we have any, uh, that is the last slide. Any final questions? If uh, we are, yes? I think you need to go to the, computer, to the microphone. Mm -hmm. You can switch in Stuart again, please. Yeah. Um, I, maybe you have some more actual information on that. I am addressing the situation that Sweden and Finland have applied to join NATO. And they both had a relatively uh, um, not supporting nuclear weapons in the past. I heard some voices before this application, for example from Finland, that they said uh, NATO does not necessarily require that we participate in all this stuff. Mm. But uh, since these documents were transferred in Brussels, I did not hear it anymore. And, uh, 
I think uh, this would be like, a, like the situation I said, if they, they might become umbrella state or they might become NATO members without nuclear weapons. And this is not a novum. There have been many states in NATO that have explicitly declared they don't want it. Even Iceland said no military on our ground at all, even if, if, if it's really uh, a relative important point. So I'm just asking, do you anything know about the position of Finland and Sweden now? Mm -hmm. Do it. Um, I mean, if, if the simple answer, uh, it's a very good question. The simple answer is if they join NATO and they do not explicitly disavow the strategic concept, then we would consider that they are encouraging continued possession and stockpiling. And I believe uh, that uh, if they um, sought to join while saying we want nothing to do with nuclear weapons, we want no threat or use of nuclear weapons on our behalf, um, I, I think their application would be difficult. So my sense, and Greta, you, uh, please jump in, but my sense is if uh, they do go ahead and Turkey li lifts its objections and they are admitted to NATO, then uh, we would be adding them to the list of states that are not compatible with the prohibitions in uh, Article 1.1. And I would also, in those in Sweden and Finland, it's important for civil society to not just, because I know these countries are saying, well, we won't have a nuclear weapons stationed on our territory. But then that brings us back to this list of how, uh, how, uh, how states today are assisting and encouraging uh, nuclear weapons related activities. And for instance, will they be escorting uh, or taking part in nuclear strike, strike exercises with their conventional air, uh, uh, aircraft? Will they be providing logistical support? Will they be uh, participating in the nuclear planning, planning group? Look at, the, look at the assistance section here and identify those, uh, those questions. I, um, I, there's, I don't, there's uh, a couple more questions here, but I will answer them in writing um, later instead, because we need, to, we need to say thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone.
Shall we, shall we go? Is it? Yeah. Okay, hello. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, here and uh, also online. And uh, thanks for joining us for our discussion here on the TPW in action, victim assistance and environmental remediation. And in this uh, session, we're going to talk about uh, Articles 6 and 7 of the TPNW, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, on victim assistance, environmental remediation, and international cooperation and assistance. So, um, welcome. So, these are the treaty's uh, response to the ongoing humanitarian and environmental consequences of uh, nuclear weapons use and testing, which as you all know, and which we're learning more about in this forum and will continue to this week. Um, these impacts you know, continue to cause harm in communities um, around the world, from the Pacific, uh, through Central Asia and North Africa to North America. And the impacts range from physical health problems uh, to psychological impacts, uh, socioeconomic marginalization, a displacement that is still ongoing and is intergenerational, and also the infringement of uh, culture and collective rights, as well as ongoing environmental contamination. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, harm in, in many ways reaches across generations in different aspects. Um, there are gendered dimensions to this. There is a disproportionate impact on indigenous communities, which is also recognized in the treaty. And uh, con communities are continuing to work around the world for better responses and support and, and for justice uh, to this day. So, uh, my name is Elizabeth Minor. I'm from Article 36. Uh, we're a UK based NGO that's part of ICANN's International Steering Group. And um, we've also been doing work uh, focusing on advocacy in this area for the past several years, um, including um, at the negotiations of the treaty with colleagues, including uh, Bonnie and others that are here today. So, in our discussion today, um, we're going to be looking at uh, these obligations, uh, Articles 6 and 7, what's in them, um, what we hope uh, these can achieve, and our expectations for the upcoming uh, meetings of states' parties as well, and also a bit more broadly at sort of where things are at the moment in terms of uh, efforts to address nuclear legacies and impacts and what we think needs to be done and needs to happen sort of moving forward so that this international framework in our treaty can, can make a difference. In terms of the format today, uh, I'll be giving our excellent speakers here about five minutes to give us their thoughts on, on this quite large topic. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions, uh, thoughts and contributions from everyone who is here um, in person and online to think about how we can move forward from these obligations in the treaty to action. Uh, because we're live streaming um, and we have a partially, partially virtual audience, uh, the question and discussion part of things will be via the online platform. So if you want to contribute or um, ask a question, do this online. You can scan the QR code which says interact with us on the back of your badge and uh, ask, ask questions in the online chat. Okay, so firstly, I'll just continue talking for hopefully about five minutes <laughs> with some more um, introductory material on, um, on our topic today. Uh, firstly, I want to quickly go through um, the content of Articles 6 and 7 in the TPNW, uh, if you're, you know, in case you're less familiar with them. So, Article 6 of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, it requires that states who have uh, populations or areas that are affected by the past use or testing of nuclear weapons to firstly provide assistance to individuals who are affected. Uh, the treaty provides that this should be uh, without discrimination and that it should also be uh, age and gender sensitive. Uh, the concept of victim assistance contained in the treaty is a sort of holistic one involving a broad range of types of assistance that, that states should provide and which addresses a kind of quite a broad range of harm, like I was talking about at the, at the beginning. So the treaty mentions uh, addressing physical as well as psychological impacts uh, through medical care and rehabilitation, as well as psychological support, and also addresses socio-economic inclusion. Uh, the treaty also mentions that this assistance should be provided in accordance with human rights law. 
Um, this is kind of following precedent in, in previous treaties, uh, which um, address victim assistance from prohibited weapons, particularly the Convention on Cluster Munitions. And this sort of rights-based approach to assistance uh, is about sort of re removing the barriers to the enjoyment of human rights for people who are affected by prohibited weapons. So just to note as well, this kind of rights-based conceptualization of victim assistance um, and way of responding to nuclear harm, it's, it's new in the kind of nuclear weapons area and it's quite different to many of the um, existing programs that exist nationally to, to address nuclear harm. So I think there's opportunities here to take kind of new approaches and respond more broadly to the range of um, impacts that there have been from nuclear weapons use and testing. As well as victim assistance, Article 6 also requires states to take steps towards the remediation of areas in their countries that are contaminated by the past use and testing of nuclear weapons. So this can, can, could include um, a range of different measures from um, those to address uh, contamination uh, and also those to increase community safety and, and block exposure such as uh, with risk education. Uh, I think it's important to note here that um, you know, no area or environment can be returned to a pre-destination state after a nuclear weapon has, has been exploded. Um, and also that environmental remediation isn't just kind of a scientific or technical matter that has sort of one you know, objective standard or answer, but it's something which should be more to do with uh, you know, addressing communities' needs and their relationship uh, with the land and um, how to kind of restore that. So that's Articles 6.1 and 2. Um, and the primary responsibility in the treaty uh, is placed on um, affected states to, to undertake this work. And this um, you know, legal structure relates to their sovereignty as states and also that they'd be best placed to kind of coordinate um, assistance that, that is given and activities on their territories. Uh, but the intention of this framework is not to place a further burden on these states really or to expect them to do this alone. Uh, rather, it's sort of <clears throat> more established as a way of bringing focus and attention that can sort of mobilize resources and, and raise standards to support affected states rather than trying to give them extra you know, burdens or responsibilities. So through Article 7, which is on international cooperation and assistance, the treaty establishes a framework of shared responsibility whereby other states' parties uh, should cooperate with affected states and those in a position to do so also should provide technical, material, or financial assistance to help them implement victim assistance and environmental remediation. And this can be doing, done in various ways, including by supporting the work of um, international organizations and also NGOs, including I suppose, affected community organizations. So together, these articles establish the first international framework uh, responding to nuclear harm in this way. Um, they're based on precedent from previous treaties, as I said, but it's the first um, in the nuclear weapons area. And um, it really establishes a structure of responsibility where I think you know, those who are concerned about these ongoing impacts and willing to do something can take the action that they're willing to do together now to try and make some practical difference uh, without having to wait for others respond, to respond. And I think this kind of you know, dynamic of collective empowerment is a lot of what the treaty as a whole is to do with. Um, just to note here that this structure, it isn't about letting user states uh, off the hook. Um, it, it doesn't. Um, firstly, of course, these uh, obligations that are established, they don't affect um, the possibility of states and others to um, you know, pursue justice through other channels or compensation or reparations. Um, there's a specific um, part of Article 6 um, which recognizes that this doesn't affect existing agreements which states may have between each other and with user states, um, so that's left intact. And also in Article 7.6 of, um, of the treaty, there's a recognition that um, for states that previously used nuclear weapons who joined the treaty have a responsibility to assist affected states with victim assistance and environmental remediation. So in my remaining minute, uh, what is the importance and promise of this legal structure? Um, I think most importantly, it provides an opportunity to work with affected communities to better address and respond to their rights and needs. Um, like I said, it can be a mechanism for uh, focusing um, attention, mobilizing resources, and developing better approaches. Um, 
It's likely, of course, this is a question for state parties, but um, uh, assistance will probably focus uh, first on those um, you know, states that are within the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So I think it's an important area for universalization work as well to bring other countries with affected populations into, into the treaty. Um, and I think that, you know, also the existence of these obligations, it puts on the agenda of the international community more broadly uh, the fact of, um, you know, nuclear legacies needing addressing and that there is this new framework to address nuclear harm. So I think as work develops and as actions are adopted by states in the treaty and affected states, um, you know, can identify their needs, States not party can also contribute assistance to this. We've seen uh, precedents related to this, for example, in the, the Mine Ban Treaty, where a states not party to that treaty nevertheless uh, contribute to humanitarian mine action and engage with uh, these kind of standards and work. So this might be an area where states that aren't party to the treaty yet can um, you know, engage with shared humanitarian goals and constructively engage with, with the treaty in another way. I also think it's you know, really an, an area for engagement um, for us as civil society. There's lots of different ways we might be able to engage different countries in this area. Um, so at the moment, I feel you know, there's a lot of potential from these um, articles, but at the moment, we're really in the first stages of um, you know, talking about them and their implementation in the treaty. Uh, this will be kind of a long-term task because of the complexity of addressing nuclear harm and also the resources that are available at the moment within the treaty structure. And so the impact, you know, it might take some time. Um, so to talk more about our sort of expectations and first steps, um, Bonnie, I think you might want to address that. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks everyone for coming today. Um, so I, my name's Bonnie Doherty. I teach at, at Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic. And I also was part of the, the team uh, that advocated for the positive obligations during the negotiations themselves. And uh, we've worked hard at, at Harvard to promote strong implementation of those obligations since then. So as Elizabeth said, the words of Article 6 and 7 are very strong, but they'll only in the long run be as effective as their implementation. And that implementation starts this week. It starts at the first meeting of states' parties. The meeting will set the priorities and lay the foundation for opera operationalizing the treaty. So the, the first meeting of states' parties advances implementation through a series of outcome documents that set out the commitments of states' parties. Those, those so-called outcome documents include three things, the political declaration, the action plan, and the final report. The final report includes the first two, but also includes some other decisions that the, that the body will make. In the case of the positive obligation, the content of those documents was largely emerged from a series of consultations hosted by Kazakhstan and Kiribati, who are the facilitators of the positive obligations. And they produced a working paper with recommendations. Uh, fortunately, those recommendations, almost all those recommendations have been included in the draft outcome documents, particularly in the action plan. And those recommendations closely align with ICANN's views. So barring any last minute changes to the outcome documents, our job this week is to encourage state parties to hold firm to that position in the, the coming days. The commitments, um, again, barring any last minute changes, the commitments states parties are expected to make at the one MSP focus on the immediate steps that states should take. And I will highlight a few of the, some of the key ones. First, there are several actions in the um, draft action plan that establish an architecture for implementation. States parties should assess the needs um, of victims and the nuclear weapons contamination in their territory uh, and their capacity to respond to that. The initial assessments should be completed by and shared with the second meeting of states parties and more in-depth assessments should be complete, completed down the road. It's a long-term you know, in-depth process, but we want to make sure they're at least completing initial assessments in the, coming, in the coming year or two. Affected state parties should also adopt a national plan with timelines and budgets and report on their progress by the second meeting of states parties. Such plans promote coordination and accountability within the state, and uh, affected states should also receive international assistance where necessary to reduce the burden of, of uh, developing that plan. All states' parties should appoint national focal points for uh, the positive obligations within three months of the one MSP. And they should adopt national plans and policies on environmental remediation and victim assistance. The implementation um, extends beyond Article 6 to Article 7. 
uh, and the draft action plan recognizes this, calling donor states to develop mechanisms to facilitate the provision of international cooperation and assistance. Most of the, this framework, this architecture, involves practical steps, but it's also important that states' parties commit to, con um, to conduct at all stages of victim assistance, environmental remediation, and um, international cooperation assistance according to certain principles. And those principles are accessibility, inclusivity, transparency, and non-discrimination. Uh, victim assistance should also be provided, as the treaty says, in a manner that is age and gender sensitive. So this, the second um, set of recommendations, which we expect the meeting of states parties to adopt, is that states parties should and are expected to adopt commitments related to reporting. The draft action plan calls on states parties to, quote, consider developing voluntary and non-burdensome format for reporting during the intercessional period. It says they should, could report on the effects of nuclear weapons and the progress in meeting their obligations. Uh, the treaty does not include reporting requirements, um, so this is an important development that they're starting to consider this in the, in the voluntary commitments. And ultimately, we should urge them to adopt that format, not just consider adopting that format, but it's still, it's still a step forward. And we should emphasize that, it, that reporting is a valuable tool not only for promoting and monitoring and accountability, but also for facilitating international cooperation and assistance for affected states, because it highlights the needs that, they, that need to be met. And we also need to stress that it's not a burdensome requirement because they can draw in models for past disarmament treaties. As Elizabeth mentioned, this is a, these provisions are modeled very heavily on those um, in the Mine Van Treaty and the Convention on Cluster Munitions. A third prong of implementation uh, they expect to be approved at the 1MSP is an inter informal intercessional working group on the positive obligations. The 1MSP is only three days, and their positive obligations are expected to really be discussed for a short period on Wednesday afternoon, and there's only so much it can accomplish in that period. So the working group should provide a forum for dealing with several key issues. First, as I said, is doing this, work, this um, for reporting format, which I mentioned, and reporting on the progress and implementation. It also should facilitate international cooperation and assistance by identifying needs to be filled. Should consider a trust fund to support affected states' parties in, um, in their work on victim assistance and environmental remediation, and to start wrestling with some of the complex issues around victim assistance and environmental remediation. And there are many, but for example, who counts as an affected individual in a community? Uh, and it's crucial that these working groups be open to um, all relevant stakeholders and most importantly, affected communities. This, is, this was somewhat of a sticking point during the the consultations, um, although a majority of states widely supported it, but something we want to stay focused on and make sure that it, those working groups remain open and inclusive process. Which leads me to my fourth point, um, which is inclusivity should cut across all the states that I outlined. Uh, relevant stakeholders outlined in the action plan um, include affected communities, indigenous groups, international organizations, and civil society, and youth. Those are the ones that they enumerated. And as I said, they should be consulted at all stages um, of victim assistance and environmental remediation, and their participation should be facilitated in the international meetings like this one, as well as in the intercessional process. So while well, in initiating implementation at the 1MSCP is crucial to getting the positive obligations off on the right foot, it's only the beginning. As Elizabeth said, it's a long-term process, uh, victim assistance, environmental remediation, and as a result, international assistance will take years and decades. Uh, and we don't have time to go into that today, but I just want to point you to a few resources. Um, one is there is a new report just released this week by the Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic, and in conjunction with the Conflict and Environment Observatory called Facing Fallout, which identifies principles for implementing environmental remediation of nuclear weapons contamination. And there's a Harvard, new Harvard fact sheet. Um, uh, for, um, summarizing our recommendations for the 1MSP, which I talked about, and principles for long-term implementation of both victim assistance and environmental remediation. There's some, a few copies of the fact sheet in the back table, and I also have the QR codes for both the report and the fact sheet on the back table. We will have, barring Austrian customs, um, we will have hard copies of the, the uh, final report in 
at the one MSP this week. It should be delivered on Monday. So stay tuned for that. I don't want to carry them home. Uh, and I also want to pitch, there's an ICANN side event, which will be looking at some of the way forward. So we'll be presenting those, those principles then. And I'm, of course, happy to talk to anyone about those topics later. So uh, I'll hand it back to Elizabeth, the MC, who I assume will hand it to Alam John. Thank you. Yes, well, th thanks very much, Bonnie. Um, Alam John, give us a perspective from Kazakhstan. Thank you. I have nothing to add after your detailed presentation. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Alimjan Ahmetov. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Yes, it's yours. Um, uh, first of all, I'm very excited that we have this treaty, and it's fantastic with, that we have this Article 6 and 7 uh, with uh, assistance uh, for survivors and uh, environment. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to share with you that in Kazakhstan, we already from, from the 90s, since we uh, get our independence from Soviet Union, we have law, national laws which support survivors in some, uh, in some way. But at the same time, I'm very excited that we have um, recommendations to establish uh, international trust uh, fund, which is included, is this um, suggestion is included to the working paper submitted by Kazakhstan and Kiribati, and I hope that states parties will, uh, will take this recommendation uh, on board. Why? Because um, Kazakhstan, we have our independence for 30 years, but till now we have problems with uh, medical assistance, social, we have problems with ecology, uh, for example, for example, I want to share with you a few examples as uh, I had several, several travels around uh, Simipalatinsk to the villages which, were, which are very close to former nuclear test site. And now in Kazakhstan we have uh, second, third and fourth uh, generation uh, which are from affected by uh, nuclear tests. And uh, these people claim to me that uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, um, these people uh, have a right for free medic medical support. It's written in a law. But when they come for free medical support, uh, they get the answer that there is a line and uh, come into line, in the line, and you will get this support in uh, half a year. Uh, or another example that um, in one family, uh, their small daughter had uh, cancer and they had to travel from that village to Almaty. Uh, it's on the southern of Kazakhstan. And this law covers assistance, financial assistance only to expenses for traveling of this daughter, small child. But it doesn't cover, this support doesn't cover travels of their parents. And they have to have somehow find uh, money to, to help her, uh, their own daughter. Uh, and very important issue still in Kazakhstan we have with the uh, uh, basic uh, social uh, and economic uh, issues, for example, infrastructure in Kazakhstan, in that uh, Simei region, region is, uh, uh, how to say, poor. Uh, for example, from one village to get uh, medical support, uh, in some places you, uh, the road uh, just doesn't exist. And it takes a lot of time to get to the uh, Semiplatinsk uh, city to get appropriate uh, medical support. So why I am saying this, why I'm sharing with this with you, that uh, even if we have like a law, it has its own uh, loopholes. And uh, I think that uh, uh, having this treaty and international cooperation, sharing, uh, uh, ex experience of uh, countries and population which are who are affected by uh, uh, nuclear weapon or nuclear testing, uh, it will help us uh, to overcome all these uh, consequences, particular diseases and ecology. Uh, and uh, this is what we have uh, to do together, I think. For example, um, in Kazakhstan, the, you know that nuclear t former nuclear test site, uh, this, its square in Kazakhstan is comparable approximately with Israel or Belgium, uh, its size. And it's hard to control it. And ordinary people 
I saw it myself uh, that children go to swim to atomic lake and they don't care about radiation. So it's the work that this huge territory must be uh, closed by a fence and it's a, it's, it requires uh, huge resources to do it. Of course, Kazakhstan works on it, but I think with the, uh, with the help of uh, international cooperation and uh, sharing experience in this sphere, it, would be, uh, it will be more successful. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and Vanessa, finally, I think there's another mic there uh, to give us a perspective from the Pacific. It should be on. Yeah, it's worked. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Vanessa Griffin. I'm from Fiji, but also from the Pacific anti-nuclear movement, and I'm part of ICANN. Um, this is an important moment for us in the Pacific Islands, where we've had many states supporting this treaty. Is this is the point of seeing the treaty at implementation stage, and why it's important for our region is, in terms of parts of the world that have had nuclear. Uh, experiences, this region has three countries affected by nuclear testing in one part of the world. And so um, of the state's parties to the treaty at the moment, I think the number is 62. If you want to look at states affected by nuclear radioactivity there and the way um, Article 6 is uh, written of who is responsible for um, being in charge of the uh, effects of either use or testing. We really only have testing countries in the world that will, we are going to be applying this to mostly. And so for the Pacific, we've got three countries. And Kiribati is one which has worked with um, Kazakhstan to produce comments on Article 6 and 7, and we're very grateful to have had a Pacific state involved in that. Um, but the, there are two other Pacific uh, countries, that is Maui Nui stroke French Polynesia. It's called French Polynesia because it's a colony and therefore is considered a part of France not by everyone in it, but that is its political status. The other is the Marshall Islands, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which contributed significantly to this treaty, but has and is a test site country. But it has great concerns about what it will commit to if it becomes a state's party. And then for the rest of the Pacific, like countries like Fiji and the many other states parties, they are deeply committed to this treaty because we all felt we experienced the nuclear testing which was atmospheric in our region. So I want to bring up some, I thought I would like to ground this a bit in the sense of what are states or countries that are affected by nuclear testing now about which there are victims and about which we need to apply these articles, particularly six, and then there is the potential of um, Article 7 and where that might address people's, uh, uh, countries' abilities or not to respond. So this morning you heard from someone from Maui Nui, French Polynesia, who spoke on the effects now. And I think the difference we need to get to is what are the conditions now? Who are the victims now? It's not like a past history over which we kind of very generally involve affected communities. I'm gonna get down to some of the tin tacks because I think that helps us of if we're having work plans and implementation, what are those gonna to have to be about where you really have experienced this? So for example, this morning we heard there are 600 new cancer cases a year in French Polynesia. There are 300 cancer deaths a year and then um, in terms of a period of 30 years of testing, um, there's even a demarcation of the number of radiation-induced diseases. And, and the person this morning reported that from 1992 to 2017, there are 10,000 patients with one or other of the 23 radiation 
induced diseases that have been recognized and accepted by the nuclear testing state. So I just think these facts need to be there of, of what the radioactivity is like, because there is a difference between other weapons of mass destruction and nuclear test weapons. One is the longevity of the impacts, where we have radioactivity which will affect human life as well as natural life for a long time. So um, I just want to establish that. So then these are the victims, and I'm going to just compare two countries, and they are not states parties. One is French Polynesia, um, where there, were there was 30 years of testing, and the other is the Marshall Islands, which many of you know well. So let's look at how are victims assisted now? They are test countries, and how are victims assisted um, at the present time? In French Polynesia, um, and I'm using the term just because it's actually politically accurate, it's a French colony, people are, are ill and still dying from the effects of the nuclear tests, which actually fit the last underground tests were in 1996. So you, we must get into our heads that decades after testing, people are still ill now today needing health and medical care. And we've had some examples from Kazakhstan. So a, a video was shown even in the World Survivors Forum um, event where there were just women who were getting cancers in 2016, 2008, 2017, 2018. And these are breast cancers, uterine cancer, and so on. So I'm wanting to make real the human harm concentrating on the human calm, because often we can address the environmental issues, but what is happening um, to human, humans affected by new, uh, radioactivity. Now, the, the victims in this particular country, there are laws established on how assistance is administered. And one very constraining law is the Morin Law, which, provide, which is set by the nuclear armed state, which determines who gets assistance or not. So we need to know these kind of things actually exist. Now, if you're looking at medical or healthcare, to have a law where a person with cancer needs to pass some tests before they will get assistance, we need to keep such things in mind of how we will respond, either as, as, as a group and the international community. So there are cases where um, assistance is decided by a committee. Assistance is declined to a vast majority of the victims needing assistance. And I'll go to the Marshall Islands. So I did a comparison because we wanted to find out, and I'm leading somewhere, to find out the, the problems that exist, but also the services, because we want to move forward of what do we want to give assistance for, but what are the avenues of giving an assistance there for? So when we're making work plans, where many of the countries will not have to report on anything actually happening in their, in their country, what would we want the assistance to be about? So um, in, in the Marshall Islands, there's, there's a um, way, another law under, under their compact, the political con compact with the United States, the former um, controlling state which did the test. Again, there's a law under which there is a clinic and under that law of the compact and providing assistance, that is determining who receives assistance. Now, um, a, thir a third point I want to raise is, interestingly enough, now in the Pacific, we are islands. You have an island, a country can be many islands, the tests are only on some of those islands. There is a geographical restriction in both these cases where um, only from the test sites do you actually have assistance to the persons affected in those islands. The rest of the country do not automatically get assistance or offers of assistance. Though that's a curious fact which goes against physics of the radioactivity and how it falls. And so that is, that is what I call a, a constraint, a geographical one, and this is in both these countries. 
in, in, in French Polynesia, it's a group of islands. Only people from that group of islands, which are considered the test sites, get assistance. And in, in the Marshall Islands, it's four test islands, get assistance. Now, everyone else is equally suffering from cancers and being ill, because the atmosphere doesn't respond to falling only on two islands, four islands, or whatever you wish. So that is actually a legal constraint for how the assistance is given to others in the population. So the point I wish to make is that we should think in terms of population-wide impacts. We often say affected communities, but we need to maybe say countries and affected populations. And then look at how you assist a population to make a different um, breakthrough there. Um, so um, the, rest, the assistance needed is often much wider than the demarcations and the demarcations have been made by the nuclear testing state. So a point I think we need to get to is an international examination and, and, and um, review of constraints for assistance to victims of, of nuclear testing. And um, I maybe um, should point out, this is no um, easy matter to face a committee where you do have cancer and are wanting assistance, and you have to provide proof and tests at your expense, and the decision of that committee under this law is, is the final one on whether you'll get assistance. Now think of islands and people with cancer and very little medical, um, sophisticated medical services. What has been happening to Pacific people in both these countries over the years is you get sent to other places if you're lucky. Hmm? So you have people going to Hawaii and the Philippines um, for medical attention. Or um, in my time, even in my youth of becoming an activist, we knew people were coming to New Zealand. And so you go far away to get assistance. So I'm trying to bring these structural issues up as a positive way of saying, if we want to help victims, let us get down to what are the constraints, and I'm putting aside the political constraints, let's get down to even international assistance, let us get to facts of, of what kind of health services are there, what do people not get, and I see it as an opening to, yes, external independent review hmm, of the assistance available for victims, and they are victims continuing today. So um, I probably do wave to me, Elizabeth, if I'm going on for too long, but I just want to then get down to, we said, well, if we're asking this, these are the problems, what's the health services now? In Maui Nui, there's one clinic. Um, originally, when I actually sat with the Pacific team to hear of what kind of assistance um, people had. It was an eye-opener for me. That was a, a, a military clinic. Um, there's one hospital, there's two private clinics, there's now going to be a cancer clinic in a country. So if you have an irradiated place, um, you, need, you need to look at what services are available. In the Marshall Islands, there's one clinic. It's not a particularly good clinic. Um, it's got the least good doctors and services, and yet that's called the 177 clinic because under the compact, that is the section dealing with the provision. So um, to wrap up, in case you're looking at me to wrap up, um, I just want to get to these points that healthcare, we need to look at the healthcare available, the services in the country, and it, we should think of countrywide um, responses, not a false, absolutely false, geographical demarcation which doesn't match the radioactive fallout. And secondly, we can look at how to be more comprehensive in the healthcare for victims. And the third one is the people who have been victims of nuclear testing often don't have data. They don't have their own health data and the possibility for independent responses where the communities and the countries are involved would be very helpful. So I, I will end there and just mention we do have two um, 
environmental remediation issues. In the Marshall Islands, there's a runit dome, a dome which is concrete covering radioactive waste. There's a threat of it breaking down, and that would enter into the sea. In Murua and Fungatofa, in French Polynesia, these are test atolls. There's a possibility they, uh, they break down the sites of the testing, and they do fear that radioactive material will enter to the sea. For all of us in the Pacific, that's a major issue of thinking of the oceans. So I'd end there to kind of paint a picture of, if we want to talk about victim assistance, this is not only the scope, but the difficulty of the assistance, and then look at the potential of, of how that assistance can really reach victims. Otherwise, I don't think we have got anywhere yet, but we are very hopeful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa, and uh, yeah, to everyone on the panel. <laughs> so I think we, we have about, um, yes, five minutes. Yeah, I know we have five minutes left. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, just want to say thanks, thanks for the contributions here. And I think, you know, Vanessa, you did a very, Good job there of letting us know about the sort of complexity of these issues and also I think the limitations of the um, current, you know, responses nationally and the laws, right, and the need to expand the concept of how we um, address these problems, which I think, you know, there's, there's promise there in, in Article 6 and 7 of the treaty and Alam Jan, as you were saying, you know, there's, a, there's also an issue of the need to mobilise more resources. So hopefully these are things that the treaty can help address. Um, I've got a couple of questions in on the, the iPad. Um, a couple are similar, so I'll maybe lump those together. There's, um, someone has asked whether Article 7 can be an option for non-state actors, specifically the EU, to positively interact with the TPNW. Um, and another question is whether we think that nuclear armed and NATO states could be influenced to contribute to a trust fund for victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, and indeed whether some more general funding like for health and environment and SDGs and aid could be broadened to include, sorry, is it? Oh, it's, it's the echo, isn't it? Also have a read of the questions. So, so these are basically two questions about um, states and other actors outside the treaty and whether they might uh, be able to uh, contribute and whether they could be influenced to, to contribute through Articles 6 and 7. Um, just to take that uh, quickly, quickly myself, um, ICANN has recently uh, released a, a briefing paper on this area, if you go to the resources section of the website, talking about possible ways that um, countries that share sort of humanitarian objectives or are donors um, to uh, sustainable development, for example, how this might align with their priorities and what kind of contributions they could make. So I think, you know, absolutely states outside the treaty and others could be encouraged to contribute here. And I think that'll be really important, like, you know, politically as well as in terms of resources. Um, another, another question uh, is to do with, oops, sorry, thanks, uh, whether... Um, yes, yeah, so given the difficulties of, of addressing um, environmental contamination in the Pacific Islands, what kinds of environmental remediation might be imagined under the treaty? And um, yeah, whether there are measures or plans to deal with the, um, the problems with the Runit Dome and Mururua Island, as, as you were mentioning at the moment. So we have three minutes left, perhaps. If anyone would like to make any final comments or respond to any of those questions, um, Bonnie, I'll, I'll go to you first. <laughs> sure, um, I'll take a crack at some and pass it down to you to read. Um, regarding the first couple of questions, yes, certainly uh, there's precedent from past treaties um, that uh, non-states parties have definitely contributed to, for example, mine action. Um, the U.S., and I'm not saying that would be the case in this situation, but the U.S. is the biggest donor of mine action, and it's not a party to the Mine Ban Treaty or the Convention on Cluster Munitions, so there's no reason that states not party could be contributing to victim assistance and environmental remediation. In this case, um, the, in the trust fund, proposed trust fund would be an opportunity for states, non-state actors or states not party, depending on how it's set up, could definitely be an opportunity there. Um, and in terms of environmental remediation, uh, maybe Vanessa might have thoughts on specific Pacific cases, but there, 
Um, in terms of, I think of environmental remediation being sort of split into a couple different things. One would be sort of addressing the contamination itself, whether it's through treat containing it or treating it. There's a whole range of technical stuff I won't get into and everything from the immediate all the way through long-term sent decades later, but also then sort of treating the, the pathways like marking and fencing, issuing warning signs, risk education. Elizabeth discussed this briefly. Um, and uh, sort of keep people out while you're doing this long-term addressing the contamination itself. So I think both those kind of steps are, are needed along the way, so wherever the contamination is. Um, but maybe you would want to add something on, on those questions. That's a quick answer. Yes, uh, just a short comment that um, I don't, personally, I don't mind if non-state uh, party would, would like to contribute to the fund, for example, but uh, I don't believe they uh, will do it because if we remember in 2017, uh, NATO states and nuclear armed states, they made three statements that they are strongly against TPNW when the negotiations began, when the treaty was adopted, and when it was opening for, for signature in September. So if they will contribute to the, for example, we say for, to a non-state party, uh, Sweden or another country, Switzerland, and they will contribute to the fund, then the question can arise, if you contributed to the fund, it means that you do not against this treaty, so why don't you ratify it? So this is, I think, the question to that uh, state's parties. They are welcome, very welcome to join the treaty and to, to contribute to the fund. Yeah, just a quick one on the environment. I think um, we often get down to the environmental impacts and there is a you know, vast range of contributions where those can be addressed. I think what I'm even picking up is we must get down to the health and medical responses and look at the ways in which that can be significantly improved. I like to think structurally that we move away from individual help for individual cases and we look at the health system in a country. What could be provided that are clinics across the country, which is a health benefit generally, and then able to address the particular history of having nuclear testing. And to me, that's an investment in the whole country and in health assistance. And then we might want, with this treaty and the humanitarian initiative and the many actors involved that really made it possible, it's do we have another wider set of resources with medical and health expertise that can really help um, in, in coming up with, I like to think, structural and institutional developments in the countries that are affected that would be long-lasting and address the fact the population needs to benefit um, from assistance. Because it's absurd and very detrimental to say only people from those four islands are getting assistance. That's the reality now in two of these countries. So you have it in another, but you're not getting assistance. I think it's inhumane, it's a human rights abuse, and we must address what the obstacle is, and then look at those generally as how to remove them, yeah? And have some other form, because it's really not helping people, but um, the need is great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you everyone. I think I'm afraid we have to close now, but uh, thanks to my excellent panel and contributions here. It was um, yeah, a lot to think about and I think we could talk for many hours about this, so, so thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the questions as well.
Hello, everyone. If we could slowly sort of settle down. If everyone who wants to come in, please still come in. Thanks. So our next speaker experienced the bombing of Hiroshima when she was only 13 years old. And she has been an integral part of the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, for lobbying governments, for the negotiations of the Treaty of, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons for decades. And we're so honored to be hearing tonight live from Setsuku Tharlow. And we're very sad, obviously, that she can't be here with us in person tonight. But we're so honored that she's going to be joining us from Toronto today. Um, thank you so much, Setsuku, and we look forward to hearing your story. You can begin. You can begin. What? Begin. You can begin now. It's wonderful to be with you again. And hello to many new friends. I'd like to meet you in person someday. Now, today, I have prepared remarks which I want to read and share that with you. The title of my presentation today is A Survivor's Journey. It is a story of a journey no human being should ever have to take. A story I have told countless times, but always try and tell for the first time, revisiting a hell I have never left and seeing a fresh, a light that has guided me ever since. So while many of you have heard my story before, I ask you all to stand with me now, a 13-year-old student assigned to decode secret messages in the army headquarters in my hometown of Hiroshima. It is early on the beautiful summer morning, not a cloud in the sky. Picture yourself there as a child, turning away, blinding, blinded by the intense bluish white flash from the window and falling away into silence and darkness. Open your eyes with me as I wake in the silence and darkness, bewildered and pinned under ruins. Imagine that the faint cries you hear, mother help me, God help me, are those of your dying friends. And then a miracle in hell, feel a touch on your shoulder, and the man's voice begging, don't give up, keep, keep pushing. I am trying to free you. See the light coming through that opening. Crawl towards it as quickly as you can. Can you see me? I am alone. The man has vanished. Hiroshima has vanished. I crawl. Stand, stare at flames, watch ghostly processions go by. Beings who used to be human, bleeding, burned, blackened, swollen, parts of their bodies missing, flesh and skin hanging loose, bellies burst open, intestines hanging, many blinded by the flush, some with their eyeballs in their hands. That is how my story began, how the story of humanity in the nuclear age began. But I'm here today to ask not how my journey, but how our journey will end. 
for the first six decades of nuclear age. The voices of survivors and victims in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and in the many indigenous homelands devastated by over 2,000 nuclear test explosions was silenced and marginalized by the nuclear armed states and their allies and accomplices. We continued, of course, to tell our stories and issue our warnings in Japan, Kazakhstan, in the American Southwest, and Russian Arctic, in the South Pacific and Australia, and in all the other places in North Africa, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, all of them poisoned, polluted, violated by nuclear imperialism. Our journeys and our suffering continued. And there were always people and states who listened, who understood, who cared. But it is only in the last 15 or so years that our voices finally broke through and help lead the way to what we are all here to celebrate. The platform we must all help to build on, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The opening that can bring to a close the long reign of nuclear terror. What happened? What went right after so much had gone wrong? Perhaps it was the unforgivable failure of the nuclear powers to seize the chance for peace and disarmament at the end of the Cold War. Perhaps it was the mockery those powers continue to make of their obligation under the MPT to negotiate nuclear disarmament in good faith. Or perhaps it was the genuine good faith shown by campaigners and activists, young and old around the world, banding together to say, I can make a difference. To work tirelessly to non-violently overthrow the old order and insist on emerging from the shadow of mushroom cloud. Whatever the reasons for the revolution, it has been a wonder to behold and a joy to be part of. But we must not delude ourselves. The old order is still standing and doomsday clock is still ticking, 100 seconds to midnight. As I can campaigners and our brothers and sisters in the global peace movement have eloquently argued the war in Ukraine makes the case for nuclear abolition, abolitions more, more compelling than ever. As I like to say, the only thing nuclear deterrence deters is disarmament, not war. It is clear that the Russia's massive nuclear arsenal helped embolden President Putin, that he feels empowered, enabled 
and protected by the bomb, by his ability to kill millions of people in seconds. Isn't that evil? Isn't that monstrous? And isn't that what the other nuclear leaders believe as well? The United States, the UK, France, China, and now India, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea, and all the members and supporters of dangerous nuclear clubs. They seem to they seem so afraid to run the risk of nuclear disarmament, but instead they run the terrible risks of nuclear annihilation, not just for themselves, but for everyone on Earth. Maybe they believe that their magically safe hands will always be able to command and control the thousands of nuclear weapons right now on high alert, ready to launch in minutes. But they cannot. This is impossible. Nuclear leaders have unsafe minds and hands. And sadly, they harbor dangerous delusion of power. This is what scares me most about the moment. About, for example, the unseemly Russian leaders of Finland and Sweden to join NATO's nuclear club without properly asking their people or even themselves what the real costs and dangers might be. It scares me that the horror and the trauma of the war in Ukraine may be used to promote nuclear weapons as protection to, to sell them as insurance in the real world of war and warriors. If that happens, then so will a chain reaction of proliferation around the globe and our great goal of global zero will recede. Just as the TPNW has brought it closer than ever. We cannot allow the lie of the nuclear age that the bomb offers a shelter from military storms to take hold again. We have to disavow that dangerous myth now before the catastrophic, catastrophic hurricane of nuclear war destroyed life on Earth. In the four frightening months since Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, massive increases in military spending and spending on nuclear weapons have been justified as responding to public opinion and concern. And for nearly five years, poll after poll, in nation after nation, including many nations in NATO, have shown super majorities in support for our treaty. In my adopted country of Canada, for example, a poll last year showed 74% in favor of signing, signing. Why did the government of Canada not honor the will of the people and join the TPNW? Their voices in the Canadian peace movement 
calling for a citizens' assembly on nuclear disarmament, empowered to make policy recommendations to parliament. Such an assembly would hear all sides of the issue, including from my side as a survivor. No such experiment has ever been attempted before. And I believe it is an idea worth carefully exploring, not just in Canada, but every country that claims the right to possess or rely on these heinous weapons of genocidal destruction. It sickens me that those countries that continue to base their defense on indefensible nuclear violence include the land of my birth, Japan, the only nation so far where nuclear weapons have been used in war. Japan's new prime minister, Fumio Kishida, is from Hiroshima, where next year he will host the G7 summit. He recently told President Biden, there is no other venue as fitting to vow to the world that mankind will never cause the catastrophe brought about by nuclear weapons. But Mr. Prime Minister, you know as well I do that the only way to ensure that humanity never uses nuclear weapon is for humanity to renounce and abolish them. And so I issue this appeal to Mr. Kishida today. Before you welcome the G7 to Hiroshima, open a national dialogue on the TPNW. Help lead Japan out of the darkness of nuclear dependency and enable Japan to lead the world toward the light of nuclear free safety. In 1995, the American poet Caroline Fauché visited my hometown and wrote a powerful condemnation of the bomb called The Testimony of Light. After evoking the horrors of Hiroshima, she concludes by wondering whether humanity would take the testimony sufficiently to heart the worst is over, she writes, but then adds ominously, the worst is yet to come. In my testimony, my, my many years of reaching for the light of peace and disarmament, I have tried to convey some sense of reality of nuclear war as the worst fate that can be befall humanity and earth. I firmly believe that if we can build on the platform of our beloved treaty, the worst of nuclear age may be over, but I fear that if we don't see the opening, the worst is yet to come and may 
come soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Setsuku. Thank you so much for highlighting, again, the repeating of the hope, this message that we're all trying to reflect this week from Vienna. And thank you so much for sharing these insights about not only your story, but also of what it means for our world today. And thank you so much to you in Ontario. And I wish you a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.